Awesome. So yeah, so we are recording for those people who couldn't make it. I, I know summer's not easy for everyone with vacation and all of that, but I uh, just wanted to make sure that those who were not here have an opportunity to watch the yeah, recording. I don't have permission to. You, you can hear it. All right. Um, so yeah, so thanks again for joining us. And I'm going to introduce John McCarthy. John is here uh, through our partnership with Dell and ALP, which is a uh, which is a training um, group. And so we've been doing a lot of great things with them uh, over the past year or two. And so we've had some extra days of training. So we decided to start hosting some esports stuff uh, since we're expanding this this uh, fall. So with that. I'm gonna let John take over. I'm here obviously as the district representative, but this is really his show. So um, I'm just here to help out and guide as well. So John, go ahead. All right, thank you. And John, by the way, I, I made you co-host, so now you you share in the power. Uh, Got it, thank you. <laughs> um, so welcome everybody. It, it's great to have you here and, and work with you. And as, as John said, my name is John McCarthy. Uh, so we say, John, we're both going to be looking at you and paying attention. And uh, I am a, um, a consultant for Advanced Learning Partnerships, uh, also working with Dell Technologies for this opportunity uh, that we're going to be exploring a lot of different things about coaching. And because we have, a, wide, <clears throat> we have a, a wide range of experience here. Uh, some of you are, are veteran coaches in esports. Now you've already been going through this process and doing work here. So you have a certain level of knowledge and understanding. And then we have, I believe on the other end of the spectrum is we have people who are just starting, who are passionate about giving students opportunities to participate and wanna be a part of this and are here to learn how to get started. Uh, and so this, there's gonna be a lot of conversations with breakout rooms and whole group uh, uh, using a variety of different resources. Please know that when you look at this agenda uh, and you see all these links, um, for, if, if for some of you feel like this is overwhelming, which would be understandable for if some people felt that way, just know that there are places to start. And as we get through these two days, there'll be time for planning and thinking. So you're gonna have opportunities to immediately either uh, plan to build what your uh, esports team program is going to look like. And for those of you who already have an esports team program, this is gonna be your time to refine and revise and reflect about your program and ask the question, how can we get better? How can we be even better in what we do? Um, Please feel free at any time to use the chat as a back channel for conversations and sharing ideas, uh, as well as this is not just listen to me talk. If you have something you wish to share, please feel free uh, to do that. I am going to ask, though, that if you're not saying anything at the moment, just make sure that your um, mic is muted so that we're not hearing any background noise that or sounds like for me, it's going to be my dog. If, if my dog sees a dog out the window, it's going to start barking. Hopefully I've got that muted, we'll see. Um, okay, so with that in mind, you know, just logistics, you can see that the, say, this is the agenda. And if you're not there, we drop in the link. This is the link that gets you to this page. And you have my contact information as well as that of my partner in crime who is going to be joining us tomorrow. And uh, you just did the code of conduct. And if you click this link, it's gonna actually take you do a PDF version of that code of conduct. So if you want to pull a copy to look at, you can do that. By the way, because uh, one of the things that those of you who attend our workshop, uh, I think it's two weeks from now, about clubs, is that you're you're going to actually get to dive into uh, access to a, a pool of a, a wealth of resources, including a draft code of conduct that you can take, revise, or use. Uh, of course, um, at the district level, there might be one being created to be consistent. So there's, there's different options there. Uh, you'll see here, these were, I asked, <clears throat> this was a recommended piece to do, to do some readings prior. If you did, awesome. You are now at the go tier of our solo queue game. And for those of you who have not quite done this yet, don't worry, you're in bronze, we won't start you in iron. 
Um, but you know, I do encourage you when you have time to go and look at some of these because what's important is that it gives us all a common understanding and context for what esports is all about. Uh, and for those of you who are already in a year or two into esports, it's, if you see some unfamiliar links here, it's well worth just to stay abreast because if we don't continue to grow and learn, there are other coaches who are coaching teams that you're going to be competing against who are going to surpass you. So we always want to stay sharp in what we do. We have down here references and resources. These are We're going to dive into all of these during the course of our two days. So please don't feel like, oh my gosh, you expect me to read this now? We're going to take piece by piece. Although for those of you who are hungry, who, who like to stay ahead of the, of the curve, if you want to jump in any part of this sooner, you know, feel free to do that. Um, as we as we do this work, you will notice what our outcomes here are. You know, we're really about how to design a a structure that is if it exists, that's even even more efficient and effective. And if it doesn't exist, then we're going to build it from the ground up and start. We're going to go slow to be to be smooth to go fast is what we're trying to do here. Please look at the norms. These are the norms for. The work we do in the next two days, normally it's really good for your gamers to create their, the norms themselves. But in the essence of time for us, um, we have here show active listening, pay attention to self and others. So again, going back to that level of experience and range, it's really kind of monitor yourself and each other, just like we expect our, our gamers to do the same thing in a team atmosphere. Uh, seek to understand before being understood. We never want to fall into that trap of a fixed mindset that we are. We feel like, oh, we already know this. If really kind of look, and if something said that you you disagree with, please share that disagreement because you know it gives the opportunity for the person to give more context, especially me. So all y'all are in Florida, and I'm this northerner in Michigan. So I know I'm from the north and from Michigan of all places. So I might say something like, oh my gosh, that's just, just what a Michigander would say. Um, then just, you know, if you think it's crazy talk, just, just say to me, can you tell me more? Because that's what I do. And that way we get more context. Strive to be our best selves. And, and that's something, you know, we want our, our gamers to do. And, you know, whatever that looks like, that's what we want to want to bring forth so that we can collaborate together. Because really all of you as a group, as a team, a network of coaches in your district, the more that we can collaborate with each other, the more effective you can be um, as you, you develop your students who will be competing against schools outside of your district. Uh, and then of course, no, have fun. It's always really important. And part of having fun is playing well with others. So if, you, if you're that person who sometimes doesn't play well with others, this is a growth opportunity and we're gonna really kind of explore that. If we can all agree to these norms for the next two days in the chat, can you please put a yes, or you can show an icon on your screen for a thumbs up. Or you can just show a thumbs up, that works too. Okay, great. So as you see, this is the agenda we're gonna be working with. Uh, the times you see listed here are loose, quotation marks, because there are certain ideas are gonna be more important to use a group than others. And if we need to spend more time there, that's what we're going to do uh, to explore that. Uh, but you'll see, we have a wealth of things that we're gonna be doing throughout the next few days. And you'll also notice that even throughout this, there's sections that's planning time, which would be independent time for the work individually or in small groups around the different parts of your program that you want to work on. So this that helps make this really, a, hopefully a valuable experience for you to, to make the time worthwhile. Okay, so all of you um, hopefully have completed the code of conduct. So again, if you've not completed it, haven't checked, but um, please make sure that you do that. And that would be uh, the link at the very top uh, that says gamer, gamer, and peace, gamer code of conduct form. And this is something that's really important because the, uh, and, and so let me just ask, let me just put this out there. You can put it in the chat or feel free to use your mic. Uh, when you think about a gamer code of conduct, what is the value and purpose of having one?
the reading um, of the expectations of your gamers, you know, how everyone knows how to behave. Okay, all right. Um, oh, create an environment where everyone can have fun. Yeah, so if the gamer, if the game, gamer code of conduct is about the environment, the culture that you're establishing, how is how can you leverage the gamer code of conduct? Once you have your, your players and, and student staff, find that gamer code of conduct and you begin your, your journey as a team, um, how, how can you leverage the, the gamer code of conduct? What are some ways you can do that? Again, you know, feel free to use the mic. You want to share that way, or if you want to type, you can type. Oh, Angelica, very good point. To hold them, hold them to those standards even in the classroom. So that's an important point. Part is that the work we do is not just about having a team, but helping the students understand that as they become better players, those skills are transferable into the classroom. Be not only a good teammate in sports, you become a good teammate in the classroom. Good point. What else? How else would you leverage the gamer code of conduct with your with your players and your student staff? So as you're thinking, just so you know, because this will happen a lot with me, there was a national study that was done, actually it's been, there's been several national studies that have been done on this question. When a teacher asks a question, how long does a teacher pause before speaking again? So there's been studies, I've looked at studies from the 70s to the early 2000s, 1970s, for those of you who are wondering, uh, early 2000s. And I've I, and in my work, I work both in the US and also uh, internationally. And when I visit schools internationally, especially before the pandemic, and I go into classrooms, I would informally test this out. And the, the results were pretty similar. So if you want to go ahead, I'd like to get at least three guesses. You can post in the chat or call it out is, how long do, do teachers on average pause after asking a question before speaking again? I see four seconds is one guess. I want to get at least two more guesses. We have five seconds. This depends on the, on the teacher or age of the group. Okay, five to 10 seconds. All right, good. These are good guesses. So the average time, and all these survey studies actually were pretty consistent in the results they found. And what they found was that the average length of time that, that a teacher paused after asking a question to students, I'll put this in the chat as well, was 0.9 seconds. So think about that, 0.9 seconds. That doesn't give anyone, if you think about it, some of your students um, are, are, are students, you know the kid who raises their hand before you have finished asking the question? Okay, it doesn't bother them at all. They're good to go. But you have a lot of students in your class that you can probably picture who aren't going to answer immediately because they want, it's not they don't have the answer, they want time to process the question. And they don't get a chance to participate. This is also true when you're coaching your players you're trying to help them think about strategy or macro play. And if we, um, and if, if we don't pause, they don't have time to kind of formulate their ideas. Um, and so what these studies showed consistently was that teachers who paused for at least three seconds had a significant increase in participation by students. Now, I do a lot of work with differentiated instruction. And what I share with people is that we want to strive to pause anywhere from five to 15 seconds. Five to 15 seconds because it's, it's, and that depends upon the complexity of the answer we want, not the question. And if we pause five to 15 seconds, what we're doing is silence becomes a gift for reflection. 
The challenge for teachers is, as you all know, is that silence can feel uncomfortable and we wanna fill it. So just know that when I ask you questions and I sit back and I stare back at the screen, at the camera and you, at you, it's, it's, it's not a confrontation, but rather I'm respectfully giving you time and I'm counting in my head to give you that space to reflect. And this is important for your players. When you are having VOD section, ses sessions, and so those who don't know what VODs are, that's video on demand where you're watching video of their gameplay, or you're watching video of college or professional players playing the sport that you are coaching, uh, and you want their students to see what they're doing and unpack for themselves without you telling them what to look for, those pauses are gonna be very important. And try to like initially, like what I did was I had to count in my head because otherwise I wouldn't give them the, the time to look at it. Um, so, and I saw as I was talking about this analogy, my original question was, you know, about what, what, how, what are ways we can use a code of conduct to, to support our students? And I, we saw, I saw someone post, teach them not to be salty and toxic. And that's so important because Salty may not be toxic, but salty is a gateway to becoming toxic. Uh, and so where is that, where, where is the line? And as we know in, in, in the gaming world, those of you who game like myself, is that there can be toxicity that happens and it starts small and it, it, can, it can grow out of hand. And so um, helping students know the difference. And also I see teach some manners in the classroom. Yes, definitely it's cross over that, um, in, that in that regard. I see we got someone to add. Um, all right, great. So I just wanted to spend some time with that about the Gamer Code of Conduct because the Gamer Code of Conduct, if it's about the culture, what we envision, then when we think about norms, we create the Gamer Code of Conduct. We have the students create the norms because as you know, anyone who comes into a room or, or, or a game has a certain understanding from their perspective of what's acceptable behavior. And so what, what one person thinks is acceptable may not be the same as someone else. Like have, have you ever been in a meeting where someone is like on their phone? Um, you know, they're saying they're multitasking. Or right now in our, meet, our session here, you know, some of you have your cameras on, some of you have your cameras off, no judgment because I never set any ground, line, ground rules about that. And that's fine, by the way, as long as you're, you're here, you're with us. Is that, but that, that's a, we all have, we're already coming in with different perceptions of what's okay with the meeting. And if we have different perceptions here, imagine your students who game, again, they deal with different levels of toxic, toxicity in the, in the gaming world and what they think is okay to do and what's not okay to do. So you bring them together to decide as a group, oops, it keeps popping up on me, what is okay to do? And they shape that. So if the gamer code of conduct is the big picture that we set those guidelines, the norms are the observable behaviors that the, the players and student staff create, because once they create this, they own it. This is their world and it gives them ways to work with each other. What questions or comments do you have about this whole idea about culture when it comes to gamer code of conduct or norms? Okay, just so you know, I was counting my head to 15 seconds just to give you that respectful time. There are no questions at this point. We're gonna continue. Just know if questions do pop up, post them in the chat anytime. John and I will monitor that so we make sure that questions are addressed. All right, so then we're gonna move on to our next section. You'll see it says need to know. And if you click this link here, it's going to take you to this space over here where you have edit access. So. You know, I don't want you to type anything yet. I just want you to jump in over here uh, to this space. Uh, and again, um, if you didn't quite see me, what I did is where it says need to know activity, just go ahead and click that link. Um, and once you click this link, it's going to take you to this page. Um, this is the page you have access. 
So the way the new no activity works, and this is a great strategy both for coaching with your players as well as in the classroom for those of you who are educators, uh, is um, what we want to do is we want to find out what you already know to begin with, what you want to know and understand, and all of you are going to be at different places there. We know that. Um, and then we're going to capture, later. secondly, what, what are your questions? What is it you want to know about coaching? And we're, going to, we're probably going to see things from different perspectives. So begin with, I'd like you to look at this um, phase one, and I'd like you to enter, uh, enter at least one or two of, um, ideas. I've already created 15 bullet points. We can add more bullet points if we need to, but at least one one or two ideas that you already know or think is important to know about either esports in general or esports in K-12. Do I have to do one for each? No, just, just I'm trying to give you two perspectives you can choose from. What you already know about esports, um, and just go ahead and, and let's take um, let's just take uh, five minutes so you can time to re reflect, and then I'd like you to and within those five minutes post in that first box. So whenever you're ready, you can begin. We have about 90 seconds left. And even this time of silence when there's no one typing, it's a topic. You just reflect more. Look at the look at what's what's posted and 
Think about what else you might know. And then when you're ready, you can always start typing again. We got 30 seconds. Okay, this is good. So what's gonna happen now is in a moment, because I do want you guys to do some talking, I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms. You're gonna be in three rooms. In those three rooms, there, there's two things you're gonna do. The first step is looking at this list of what we say is a group or collective knowledge. What is something here that was either new to you? Like, oh, wow, that's interesting. Never thought about that before. Or what was affirmational? Wow, th this point is something I've always thought, and I think this is, this is valuable, this, this is important. Either one. You're going to share that in your group. And then the next thing you do is you're going to talk within your group about what questions you have. And just go ahead, you're going to brainstorm. No, you're not going to type in here just yet. You're just going to talk about what questions you have. I'd like you as a group to come up with at least five questions as a group and then decide which are what, what are your um, your top two or three questions. Like if, you, if there's only two or three questions you got answered these next two days, what would they be? Um, and, then, uh, and then when we come back together, then we're, we're gonna fill this in. So you're not gonna fill this in yet. You're just gonna have the conversations. Now this, this conversation is gonna be for about five minutes. Once you get into breakout rooms, you'll have five minutes to talk. Are there any questions about the direction? Okay, I am now going to open up the rooms and you can just go ahead and join and the five minutes will begin. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so at this point, I would like for, for you to go ahead and enter the, your top three questions that you came up with as a team. And now uh, let's, and that will be in the, in the second box, the phase two box.
Good, good wide ranging questions. And go ahead and type. And, and as we are doing this, you know, some questions are going to be require some conversations that we're going to do. Some questions are John questions, which are pretty awesome because then I don't have to answer them. Um, the beauty though is that as we as we go through these next few days, as we find answers, we're going to we're going to annotate these questions. We're going to like shift enter. We're going to type what the responses are, so that you will have this as a reference um, point to go to. So. In just a moment, for example, there's one that's going to be a really easy to answer to do, and that's going to be question 11. Then let John answer that as soon as we finish posting our questions. So we'll wait till all the questions are finished. I can't tell if someone's writing something at item 13, and if you, or if their cursor is just there. So if you're going to write something, we'll just kind of leave that there. If you're not, if you can just move your cursor, then I know 13 is not going to be something we're adding at the moment. That would be the anonymous otter, whoever is the anonymous otter. Okay, maybe not. We'll do that. Um, and again, before I have done answer that question, this is the need, this is what the need to know activity is all about. It's about having students generate their questions because if they ask the questions they have buy-in to the work you're doing. So this is great, not just for your teens, but also for the classes that you teach. Um, and also know that uh, I keep getting, sorry, my Google Authenticator is uh, wonky at the moment. Um, it's also, just so you know, anytime today and tomorrow, if you have more questions uh, individually, feel free, just add a line and just type in the question. and. You know, we may, we likely not can get all the questions answered in the next few days, but what we don't get answered either, I'll do some annotations or I'll leave that for John and team to think about what they would like, to, how they like to respond. All right, so with that in mind, John, could you give some, your, your um, direction about 11, will shooting games be allowed? Sure thing, um, and so this will be easily addressed when you actually get a copy of the permission slip as well. Um, I, I, there's actually a couple of them um, on there that could be addressed by the permission slip. So um, first things first, uh, first person shooters are not allowed. Um, that is a district uh, superintendent uh, and our chief police officer call. Um, I sat at the table with executive leadership, and that was their their um, their demand at the point. Um, I I am a gamer, so just know I I don't I understand there's a balance, and so I also understand there are a lot of people who do not understand what esports is and see first person shooters as negatives. So currently, first person shooters are not allowed. However, I will be starting to advocate for Overwatch as to be a possible first-person shooter um, because Overwatch is more cartoony. It's no blood. It's not realistic. Um, however, right now, it is, they're all um, not permitted. And I think, uh, John, I'm just going to steal your screen for just a second. Go right ahead. And so this is part of the permission slip from last year. And I will, uh, like I said, I will be updating this and emailing this, but this is kind of what the question is, is this bottom of page two and start of page three. So this is what we're looking at. Um, the, the three ratings we're looking at are E, E10 plus and T. So I know we have a mix of middle and high school in here. So uh, if you're middle school, you can play games all the way up through E10+, plus, and then high school can move into the T for teen. And then what we have is some examples of the games that uh, will be used at those different levels. Um, so these are obviously not an exhaustive list. This is just for parents to kind of get an understanding of what types of games will be used. We went with the actual grading system since it's a, a you know a nationally known thing, and um, we wanted to stick with something parents would understand easily, 
when they're signing up. Now, again, this may adjust if, uh, if we do move into Overwatch. Um, however, the permission slip does kind of uh, spell all of that out for the, um, for the parents, okay? So I, I hope that helps with, the, there was a question there like what games to choose as well, which I know we'll talk more about later, but you know, this kind of will help guide you down that path as well. Um, and and I, I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but what I also wanna encourage is to start small. <laughs> uh, one of our schools in the pilots just tried to do like five or six games and it was totally overwhelming. You know, so when I say start small, like maybe Minecraft is your first game. If you don't have gaming computers, you know, you can run Minecraft on all of the Dells at your school. Um, it works on almost every device except for the Chromebook right now. So, you know, there are options even when we get into talk about funding and things like that later. Um, but I just wanted to share that, uh, that graphic with you guys. Um, Nellie, I will be emailing you. This is last year's release form. So as soon as legal uh, tells me whether or not I need the COVID statement in it, I will be emailing it out to all of you. So you'll definitely get it before school starts. Um, I'm just waiting to hear back from legal. And D for teens in high school, what is it for middle school and elementary? Is there a different standard? Um, e for everyone uh, and E10 is also. So high school can use all three and then Elementary, uh, middle school is E um, or E10. And like I said, as soon as that permission slips, as soon as I get that email from our legal department, I will, I will fire that out to everyone so you all have a copy of it. There will probably also be an online process. So basically, uh, IT created a nice little thing for us where you'll actually be able to go in and add the kids to your eSports team which will give them permission in the background that we're all working on. Um, so you would upload the PDF of their signed PDF and then you would put their name in there and then it'll automatically give them access to be able to, to play the games after school. So that's more IT stuff that we'll probably talk about in the August, uh, September meetings. Um, and uh, this list is great because I'm also taking notes for what I probably should cover in the, in the larger district meeting, so. All right, John, go ahead. Great, I'm just gonna do a, a quick format here so that it will be more readable. There you go, All right, perfect. All right, and so we're gonna, we're gonna, we'll be coming back to this list periodically uh, to answer more questions or see if we get questions answered just through our explanation, but, um, <clears throat> But this the kind of check uh, as far as um, this question: Will shooting games be allowed? Uh, I just want to ask the group: Do you does any does, does anyone not feel like they had they got a, like their question was not answered, that, or rather there was more to this question that they had? I know there's still a piece about Splatoon, but Splatoon kind of fits under. Uh, game selection for competition. Um, and, you know, that's something to explore there. But just in terms of shooting games in general, um, basically, was this answer clear enough or did you need, do you need more? If you feel that this answer was clear enough, please post, either show a thumbs up or say yes. If, if you feel like it was not clear enough, then please in the chat post no. Splatoon is not a first person shooter game, or is it? It's that's pretty. I mean, that's a like a paintball game. Yeah, I'm gonna move Splatoon under game selection committee so that we don't lose it. Okay, but that it could be addressed. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I hate to put it under yes because it, it, it doesn't quite fit that it's category. Different. Yeah. I mean, Splatoon isn't first person, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, because third person. Like, yeah, because we talk about yeah. first shooting with paint. Yeah, but it's still a third person. It's third person shooting. Yeah, it's officially a third person shooter, not a first person. Um, so that's one I'll have to look into. That one hasn't come up during the pilot, so I, I can just like end the rating for Splatoon. I don't know. I still don't. Okay. Hey, what is the rating for Splatoon? All right. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to table the conversation on Splatoon for now. On the website. Um, the, and the, re the reason. It's E10 with cartoon violence. Yeah. So I'm going to ask everyone to stop. We'll come, we can come back to this conversation because there's a place um, where we talk about game selection. And I want to use that time there for that. For that. And that's why I put it under here so that we don't lose that. Because I know that's important for some of you to talk about, to address Splatoon. Um, but because no one's, everyone seems to say this, is, this has been answered. I'm, this is why I've bolded it because that means it's answered. We, can, we don't have to come back to this unless there's some nuance that needs to be looked at. Okay. And just as a side note, when we do talk about game selection, it's not just the ESRB rating that you need to consider um, as a district or as a team, because you guys should have input to share feedback is you, every, what districts do, schools do, is they identify what are what is the Oops, criteria. Hmm. I'm sorry. Duty. What, That's Call of Duty. Um, call of Duty. Okay. Let me just go ahead and finish this idea. Call of Duty has been known to be a very toxic game. Okay. On the with voice chat. All right. I'm going to ask you guys just to kind of, the so criteria, you guys establish what the criteria is for game selection. So one criteria is, would be about ESRB rating, you know, T for teens, things like that. Uh, districts also look at criteria in terms of, you know, when we talk about, quote, violence, you know, there's a, there's a range from, you know, blood splatter to just like bubbles and someone falls to the ground. Um, so could, you, could, you could get a game that's T for teens, for example, that has blood splatter. And someone say, okay, well, it doesn't fit the criteria. So that's why that's a later conversation that as John is looking at that at a district level, it could be very valuable for this group to share your thoughts about what should be part of the criteria list when a game is chosen. And, that's, and, and we can use Platoon later on as, as a context for that. All right. Agreed. Can I just hop in for one quick second, John? Because right I have Go to right hop ahead. to yeah. my other meeting at 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I do want to reiterate something I did put in the chat, though. You know, we did our pilot. That was a pilot. But things are still flexible, and there are still questions we have not answered. Um, so as we expand, there are going to be, quote, quote, growing pains as we figure out exactly what is okay. So I am not the final say-so. I am what I call myself a peon at the district level. Um, so, you know, when these questions like Splatoon, where does it fit, that's something I'll have to take to my leadership and, and get their feedback and, and answer, but it's not saying a no right now. It's just saying if you see something and then there's a question that you have that doesn't fit with what we're saying, things are still flexible. This is not all written in stone with the exception of we were told no uh, first-person shooters and no uh, M for mature. So those are the two that we've been told immediately that are absolutely not. So, all right, with that, I have to hop to another meeting, but I will hop back here at 11 o'clock, John. Okay, great. We'll see you then. And, yeah, and, and that's the thing. is that Once you, you guys think about in the background, because we'll come back to this again, is criteria. What do you think should be appropriate criteria? Because then that will help the district support your experience of, you know, there's a difference between Overwatch and CSGO. There's a difference between Splatoon and Overwatch, you know, and you can, and, and for people, I'm going to say, who are not knowledgeable, understanding of that, who just say blanket statements, that's when you, you can start to put cracks into that. Because at the end of the day, everybody wants kids to have a positive experience. And, and there's lots of games to choose from. And then we can kind of help cater to that. Okay. Okay, great. And I saw a question about we're going to get access to Steam. If you think that's an important question to be addressed, please add it to this need to know list. Um, because this is not just a list for our workshop. This list will live beyond this workshop so that you can um, come back and, and explore that. All right. Great. Great conversations. And so that's going to bring us into this piece about, you know, why competitive esports? And I want to, you'll see this link. This link is going to take you to uh, a PDF uh, that, I'm trying to see where I have it here. Oh, that's the Gamer Code of Conduct. 
It's also the Gamer Code of Conduct. Okay, here we go. It's gonna bring you to this type of page here. Uh, and this is just to really give us a perspective and context because as coaches, when you're looking to communicate, like I saw like some questions about how we can get funding, how we get equipment, how we're gonna get support, how do we communicate these things? Um, this is a document that is one of several that will help you, you know, uh, uh, to explore some key information uh, that you can you can use. Uh, and so, it's, when we think about this, you know, this idea because esports, it's 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 a profession. It's not just a profession of players, but it's it's content producers, it's sportscasters, it's marketing people. Uh, it's it's every job, lawyers, administrative assistants, all of these are people who work in the industry. Uh, so when you have some parents who say, I don't want my kids to be playing computer games, think they're going to be a player, I want them to go to law school. It's like, all right, well, they can do both because you could be a lawyer for an esports company or, or program. And so we just got to kind of look at this just for the moment so that um, the context we have is feel free I think a lot of you are more com most comfortable posting in uh, the um, in the chat. You can use that or unmute yourself to to share your thoughts. But yeah, this is a little bit about myself. Um, of course, that League of Legends, Legends Bronze One needs to be now adjusted to Iron One. I just I just switched from AD carry to jungler, and so <laughs> it's been a learning curve. Let me just tell you. <laughs> Those of you who have done this, you know, you, you feel my pain, I'm sure. Um, but this is so that I've been a gamer for all my life. And as I, I go through this part, I'd like if you could share in the chat, what is a game you currently play that maybe your students play as well? And if you're not, if you haven't been playing games, what's a, what's a game you that first got you started back in the day? So for example, Legend of Zelda was like my my all-time favorite at the very beginning. I like that better than Super Mario. Um, uh, <laughs> we're stuck. Okay, you and me, you can, we, we'll, we'll get through this. Um, and, um, you know, so just kind of list the games that you play. This this one game you play now, um, even if it's on your phone, uh, and then what's one game that got you started? Uh, you'll see my my colleague, uh, Nesli, who will be joining us tomorrow. She's uh, She does a lot of work internationally. Uh, as with with what she does in supporting many schools, uh, particularly in Europe, as they are developing their teams, and you can see the games that she plays. Uh, she's a big Wild Rift player. Um, I have to find out what her ranking is right now. I see Donkey Kong, Clash of Clans. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, Oh, League of Legends, I thought for a moment someone said Lotro. Lord of Rings Online is my go-to MMO that I, I, I love playing. Um, so when we think about esports, when I think about like how do we define it, which is a multiplayer video game played competitively for spectators, typically for by professional gamers. Um, and this is important because you know students have so many opportunities uh, for college access, all the way into uh, being part of professional organizations. Again, not just not necessarily as players, although players is an option. But just like the NBA and NFL, the chances of becoming a professional player is less than 1% based upon the population of players. And so with that hard reality, you really need to look at how we can leverage college and ex college and career experiences for students who may not go to college, but go directly into the workforce. There is There are opportunities for them that we can provide some experiences, even as we run your, um, your teams because these are the skills that they can get. Um, make this a little bit bigger for you. This is from NAIS, the National Association, Association of College and Employers who surveys their membership um, annually. And when you look at this list, look at what, is, this is the top 10 of what their survey responses of colleges about incoming students and employees, I'm sorry, employers about the incoming employees, the skills they want them to have when they walk in. And do you see anything that stands out that you, that you think is really valuable, both in competition and in the classroom? You know, feel free to share that in the chat. Or again, you can use your mic at any time. 
Um, I said, oh, Witch in the Woods. I got to check that out. That sounds interesting. Oh, it's Little Witch in the Woods. I just, I just wonder what that's about. Um, Final Fantasy 14. I, I think it's, it's a Final Fantasy. <laughs> yeah, that's OK. Is that, the, is that the MMO? I can't remember. I play a little bit of that. Um, yeah. So yes, okay, that's the one. Yeah, I I I I like their um their crafting approach. Um, yeah, I mean, look, building to work as a team. Number one, problem solving skills. I mean, usually, ability to work in the team and communication, collabor communication, verbal and written are usually in the top five, top six every year in the surveys. Um, so I mean, these are the skills that that they they want to see when students come and employee employees come to jobs. Here's the beauty of this for esports. In order to improve as a player and for your team, but let's say about being as a player, aren't these the same skills that they need? You know, those of you who play ranked in whatever your respective games might be, you know this experience of you know playing solo queue and just how up and down that can be. And yet, if we if you have these skills, especially the top three, ability to work as a team, which even if you're working on your own, being if you have a, a champion that's a facilitator, knowing how to facilitate with that with that champion, and then problem solving. If you say, if you have a player on your team who's just doing poorly, how do you compensate for that so you can still be in a position to win? These are these are important skill sets they have uh, to to challenge that. Uh, and so we can develop these with our students. And when you look at uh, the growth, sorry about that. I gotta see why that is popping up on my screen. Uh, we, we can see like this is the, the type of revenue growth that is happening. Uh, and you, you can see by 2022, esports is um, you know expected here to. To, uh, in terms of esports alone, is, is about you know over a half a million um, in revenue, but over a billion dollars um, in terms of global revenues. Uh, the thing about this is is that what it, what it is not telling you is that the titles themselves in, are are may are already exceeding a billion dollars. And the the important thing to understand about the money that's coming in is that with this type of money happening, that means there are more job opportunities. You know, this is why, you know, teams have, for example, physical therapists and personal fitness trainers working with their players. You know, why they have sports um, psychologists working with their players, why they have uh, uh, social media or, or marketing people, you know, because it's, it's, it's a growing industry and they're trying to keep continue to have it grow and expand. Um, so there's just things that we can look at for for our students to to experience in school. Uh, you can see this is showing you audience growth and how it continues to 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 get bigger and bigger uh, in terms. And, and if you have more audience growth, that means you have more advertisers, more sponsors who want to get involved, which again means more money coming in that can be used to bring in more people to do the work. And so why should we care about this? Well, because these are some of the opportunities that happen in school that we can also really emphasize. Uh, you know, there's been, you know, there was an article uh, with a founder from Riot uh, pre-pandemic where one question that was asked was like, what do you look for when someone, you know, wants to come work for the company? And what the co-founder said was, well, one of the first things we look for is, are you a gamer? Because if you're not a gamer, we're not interested. Think about that. Why would someone need to be a gamer? Because a big piece of that is culture. Because remember we talk about like how the culture would be up and down. If you understand the gamer culture of the game title, you have a lens that enables you to help the company communicate to your target audience. And you can see under business, you got HR, marketing, production, stage, video, audio, uh, you know, journalism, you know, design, coding, all of these are relevant. And these are outside of sports. That there are so many opportunities for our students to be a part of. And there are lots of programs. Just so you know, on the right-hand side, 
these are games, all these games in some form or fashion have an esports component. Yes, even Tetris is an esport. If you've not watched competitive Tetris, just Google it, Google it, take a look at it in YouTube. Yeah, Stardew Valley is a speed run. They're different, it's a speed run genre that if you explore, it, it's, those are competitions. Lord of the Rings, remember I said I like to play Lord of the Rings online? They have speed, run, speed runs for that, that you, know, you can compete in. Um, I can play solo queue and rank. Uh, I like to play with friends because then we dual queue. <laughs> But that, that's how I handle that. League has sponsorship with LV. I can't know what LV stands for. Can you, Angelica, can you? Um, Louis Vuitton. They had a whole oh. sponsorship with Louis Vuitton with skins, clothes, shoes. I think Supreme did a sponsorship as well. There are other designers that do mm. sponsorship with League. But I think that's geared more towards the Asian market than the American market. I mean, we get Buffalo Wild Wings sponsorships with League, but we don't get <laughs> LV. Yeah, well... Um, I, I, just the fact that they're involved, it just shows just how a lot of these games have become mainstream. Um, so, you know, take a look at this information right here. You know, at one point, you know, scholarship money for colleges was up to 12 to 15 million. Sorry, up to you know, $20 million in scholarships. But also look at, look at the, the number of high schools are clubs that are, are available. These are big numbers, and this means more opportunities for our students to be involved. And so when we think about that, there's just, and we're going we're to dive into this a little bit, there, there are just ideas around college and career opportunities that we can provide for our students because it, it's just, it's an avenue. You have, there are kids who Esports becomes the first entry point where they feel like school reflects them that they didn't have before you had an esports program. And you can probably picture those kids right now. I mean, that this is the way that they come in, just like someone who might be who loves basketball or football or volleyball or track. You know, they had entry points. Now, for esports, there's a group of gamers who now have entry points. Okay, just keep, if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to ask them or, or takeaways. Um, I love the thing about Louis Vuitton, you know, post those in the chat as well. Uh, so I'm a math teacher. All I teach is problem solving skills. So if we bring in some esports data and use it that way, that could be a great experience for students. So this is some information from DePaul University, their esports program, which is in Chicago. And on the right-hand side, you just you see a lot of their stats of things. This was based upon uh, 2020, 2019-2020 um, school year. But I want you to zero in on intramural participation, 12,000, 1,200 students that they had involved. Oh, thank you, Angelica, for that link. Um, and on the left-hand side, this is what they discovered from, or what they, they learned about their students you know, sense of belonging, class attendance increasing, assignment completion increasing, grades improving. You know, some people think, wow, this is something new. And yet, should it be new if you're running an esports team? Because isn't that what we get for traditional sports? So these are things that we can really be thinking about. This is some of the data that they, came, they, kept, they found, which was in this case, you can see that uh, they asked the question, like how many programs have you been involved in other than esports, or, or rather, esports, you know, you know, was just like not. And what you can see is like, is that forty-eight percent said essentially the green, that esports was the first time. So almost half their students involved. This was the first time they felt connected to their school. Which nationwide surveys is at forty-seven percent. So that's a huge number. That's almost half the kids. Uh, which can be reflective of our own kids you know, in, your, in your respective school. You know, this information, this one I found really powerful. This was about, you know, based on your experience in esports, to what extent have you built relationships, you know, found groups, made friends? And when you combine the, the green and the blue, the green is just is saying, I found groups that I now meet with regularly um, because of esports, which is 41%. You add the 21, 22% saying, I actually made friends. 
we're looking at 63% of students saying that they are finding a connection exclusively because of the esports program. And that's huge. Now, just to put that a little bit in context, I ran a summer camp, and uh, and this was for high school students and middle school students. I, I work with middle school students in the morning, high school students in the afternoon. It's a two-week summer camp. And I, I took several of those questions, and I built them into my own survey just to see what I would get. And when you ask the, the campers, you know, to what extent were you making friends, you know, during the camp? And... You know, you, you can look at these numbers. It was, you know, seven, three, seven, you know, we look at red, red, orange, and green. Um, I mean, it's just huge numbers. And the blue, no one, it was about 1%. One, I think it was just one student. Out of, out of 37 kids, 36 said, from this experience alone, I made connections in new front. I mean, so those are just really important how your teams can establish relationships. And this becomes a thing about equity and inclusivity because esports is a way to bring more kids into the school community to become part of the culture. So I got this here, no cheating, don't look at the next slide if you already have this up, um, is what do you think those percents are? This was based on a Pew research study. What percent of boys and girls do you think played video games as of 2018? If you go ahead and post your numbers in the chat, or if you want to share it, you can just say it. Uh, I see 50-50, okay. 50%, 50 boys, 50% girls. Oh, interesting. 40% boys, 60% girls, okay. And then 60 boys, 40 girls. All right, so here's what the Pew study came out with. 97% of boys and 83% of girls. So when you think about, especially the girls, a lot of times people will, will think the girls, there's, there's far fewer girls involved in, in, in gaming. And when you think about 83%, that's a big number. And, and yet when we look at esports programs, we don't necessarily see girls reflected, you know, to that extent or anywhere near that extent in, in the games. And so we need to think about one of the conversations you're going to explore during this session and then more in depth uh, with um, when we talk about clubs is how do we intentionally recruit to ensure that we get a broader representation of students um, as part of our, our team, our team program. Um, Danny, can you, can you elaborate on that? You said, I think we're all trying to do boys versus girls population wise. Um, it's just when all of us did the 50, 50, 40, 60, I think we were saying out of the whole population, it's 50% boys and 50% girls instead of the 97% of boys yeah. and 83% yeah. of girls. I think we all got a little mixed up on that one. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Well, and, and the thing is, and if, if our programs are 50-50, that would be amazing. That would be absolutely amazing. Um, and if you already have that, then be ready to share these next few days because we need to learn how to, how to do that. But it's just making that an intentional part of, of what of our planning. So here's just some quotes, you know, you know, from students talking about esports. And I'm often antisocial. I don't like to get involved in club activities. Esports is my first time meaningfully participating in extracurricular activity. Finding a community where people share the same interests as me has given me a great friend group. I have become a more confident person as a result, and I will am willing to put myself out there more and have new experiences. We, these are the things we want for our students. And, you know, yes, there are students who are already involved in the school community who do play esports and games, and we welcome them. We also, there's the added bonus and important focus on the kids who up until now have not been, who show up to school as a guest and not as someone who's part of the, the school family. And we want them to feel being part of the family, which is always our intent. Any questions at this point or important takeaways that you have that, and if, or that you think it's important for people in this group to be mindful of? 
you know, you can either use the mic or post in the chat. Okay. So you do have this particular um, piece. Like I said, it, it's in this link under why competitive esports is a PDF. There are data points in there that uh, you may find useful to share with stakeholders to garner support or to, to motivate or excite um, the people you're working with. And that's why you know, we wanna keep those things in mind. All right, so here's what's gonna happen. In a moment, we're gonna take a 10 minute stretch break. Um, during that time, uh, I mean, just and when we come back, we're, we're gonna get into first, just what are the nuts and bolts of starting, getting started with the team or you know, moving forward, give you that space to be thinking about that and have some planning time to think about what you're currently doing. Uh, and then we're gonna follow that up uh, and start di diving into culture. So that's our plan. It is now 1018, so if we can come back at 1028, I'll see you guys then. Yeah. Okay, so we're back and we're ready to go to our next uh, area. But just before, just kind of hit a pause. We had some time to digest those um, important details about why esports is so important. And uh, as you think about what are there, what are some um, what is an idea or or a um, that you already knew or that you think is important for everyone here to under to know or what's a what's a new aha that maybe you didn't have before um, about this these ideas of the value of esports for students. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some of these resources that we have here. So there's two things we have. If you are just getting started, this first link, this says quick checklist for establishing a competitive team. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're our veteran, then it's just something to, to kind of to um, skim through, just see like what steps that, you know, that maybe might give you some more thoughts about um, and fortunately, though, like as a district, there's some of these some of these parts have already been answered for you. Um, like, for example, a team format. You're, you know, you're just this is a this is like kind of supposed to be a guide to kind of help you think through a quick guide of what should be part of your team. So, you, know, you already identified you're doing a school teams <clears throat> for this. You know, when you're choosing at esports, here are some initial thoughts that we might we might explore in terms of. You know what should be key criteria um, for deciding. You know what. You know what your titles might be. You already have your platform. By the way, who, which coach here went to compete at the nationals? Is the coach here? All right. Well, I know that you guys use EDF for your uh, platform to compete. So you already have that is already de determined um, what you're gonna be doing. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of times there's like different considerations when you consider a platform. Uh, EGF sounds like it's, it's a great platform for your district and what you're, you're trying to accomplish. Uh, John spoke highly of that one. Uh, equipment needs, these are just, these are not required. These are suggested considerations when you are exploring what you're doing, whether it's a team or a club, um, what you would have, 
for for um, practicing competition. Uh, as far as desktops, laptops, it when you're just when you're just getting started, it really doesn't matter which. What matters is that whatever you're using, that device actually runs the game that you need it to run and, um, efficiently. Uh, and you know, depending upon the lap, the, the computer will determine what you what what in some ways what titles you can actually do. So, for example. You know, if you're playing a game like Rocket League, which has more high intensive graphics and requirements than say League of Legends um, needs in terms of you know what to run, or if you're gonna do Super Smash Brothers, then you're gonna have to have a switch in order to, to do that um, particular piece. As well as think about streaming production. And remember, I talked about having student staff, is that you might have some student staff who are in charge of either of the live streaming or the recording of your games to be posted later on. Uh, so thinking about you know giving opportunities for your students to do that, as well as the, having students who are gonna be shoutcasters um, who will do the play-by-play -play or the post-production analysis. Um, these are just things to, to uh, consider. Some tournaments require you to have a camera on the player. I don't know if any of you've run into that yet. Um, you know, that, that's been a recent piece for some areas. Well, that can impact the, um, your student release, parent release form to allow students to know fa images, faces to be online. Uh, you might, that, you know, a comparison to this is, is like, if you already probably live stream your football or basketball games, then, you know, we see those student athletes that their faces are on there, their names are there. Uh, and you know, look at what the release form is for them, and, and that could be adapted to what you use for, for esports. But these are things we want to think about. Let me pause here for a moment. Especially those of you who have been running an esports team or club, can you share your insights about streaming production? Do you do any streaming at this point? And, and just in the chat, could you just, because those of you who, who currently have already been coaching our, uh, a team or, or esports club, can you just list if you have uh, which one? Just like so I know who in our group has done this and, and, and the rest are who are new to this. And if you're new, can you just type new in the chat? And that way I know that how many people are new. Because this will in, this will affect how I I continue this conversation. This is really helpful. Cash and gaming, okay, okay. Have, do any of you have experience with um, streaming or recording games? Okay. And so streaming and recording can be a real easy setup. One of the questions um, that someone asked, and that it will come back to that later in your nose, is what if kids pick a game that you as an adult is not are not familiar with? Um, this is also similar to this. What if you're not familiar with like Twitch or, or live streaming or OBS, which OBS by the way is free and the industry standard for um, streaming and recording games. Well, if you're not familiar with it, but you don't have to learn how to do it. Um, you got a lot on your plate already, but you have students who either already know how to do it or are, are very interested in learning how to do it and they can do it for you. You just gotta manage your group. This is also true and with teams and those of you who, like I think, uh, Daniel, you've got experience with teams and, and um, can share in this is that if you happen to coach a in your first year, I'm sorry, it's first year, if you happen to coach a game title that you have no experience with, so let's just say it's League of Legends and you just never played League of Legends before, um, and you've never really watched any sports for that, initially that that's fine because you have students you have and you you you're gonna you're gonna lean on some of those students to help you manage and run the team. What we're gonna be able to do today and tomorrow is give you the language and context so that you may not know, but you'll 
but you'll be able to know what questions to ask and, and also have a structure within which you can help your students work with them. Because here's the thing that you have that your students don't have. You have rich experience on classroom management and how to develop uh, the global professional skills by SD standards for students around digital citizenship and communication and collaboration. You know that area. And being able to manage and develop your students in that area and then they bring their knowledge to the game. Now, once you have that, it is important over time is to watch professional, the professional and college competitions of your title of choice. And at some point, do even just casually start to play the game. You never have to be good at it. You just have to understand it. And as, the more you understand it, even if you are the worst player in your mind for that game, the students will appreciate that you are investing time in the game they're playing. And that will help improve those conversations. I mean, there are coaches for basketball and football who played minimum um, games themselves, but are, are great coaches because they're students of the games. They've learned, they've studied film, they've watched and they grow and you can be in that place too. And you'll see things like educating family and community. This is important for your stakeholders to get support. Um, for what you're trying to do. So, you know, there are misconceptions about esports. I think one of you wrote a comment that some people think don't take esports seriously. Well, it's because they don't understand the money that's available for college um, opportunities. They don't understand the, the career opportunities that students can seriously be involved in uh, and that we can provide some of those experiences for them. Um, so, those are things about you know to to, to really look at. They they think that oh the kids have spend four or six hours in front of a computer. Well, that's not healthy. I need them to get outside. Well, you know, professional uh, teams require their their players to uh, to exercise. They have workout routines as well as to eat right, just like you do with traditional sports. Why? Because in tournaments, let's say League of Legends, if you play a best of three and you go all three games, you're looking at three hours of competition. That's a long time. That's, that's a little bit longer than a football game. And, and those of you who, if, if you've coached traditional sports, could you list the sport you've coached um, in the chat? Because coaches know, I, I, coach, I, I coach volleyball, basketball, and track. And I can tell you, and I'm sure those who have coached, you've, You've seen it too, like like Tina. You know, in soccer, like the the team that's most conditioned and ready to go in the second half of the game or the last quarter of the game is the the team that's going to have the advantage. And so that is so important for mental focus. Um, oh, look for looking for a chef. Okay, thank. And that's a great point. That like, because they'll have chefs who are going to create. The, the food for the, the players, you know, they are, they're based on what the nutritionist tells them that they need to be eating to just to be mentally strong um, and not be tired when they when they participate. You participate in a tournament that goes all day. You know, if you're tired in the second half of the tournament, you're probably going to bow out. You're going to your team's going to lose, and because you're just not mentally focused anymore, or as focused as you need to be. And just like in traditional sports, this is especially true in esports, is that if you're not sharp and watching the screen and making your uh, split second decisions and watching the map from the fog of war, if you're not, not able to do that and be alert, you're going to lose, because likely because the other team is, if they are well conditioned, they're going to be, they're going to be ready. So that's something to think about when you are running a team is, do you have a conditioning program? Because if not, that's something to look at. Do you have stretch out routines where especially wrist stretches that they do each day? So before they even touch the keyboard, uh, the, what do you, th what, what group of, of people do esports have similar injuries to? I know it's really broad, broad and vague, but if you know what I'm talking about, you'll have the answer. Because their injuries are very similar to another group when we think about um, different types of work. 
I see a good guess about tennis. Um, <clears throat> there is some close things to tennis, but there's, there's another group. Maureen, can you elaborate on that? Why do you say IT professionals? Uh, because of the eye strain. Mm. Yes, eye strain and IT professionals are part of that group that's called office workers. So those of us who sit in a chair all day in front of a computer, there's the eye strain, there's back injuries, depending upon your chair, your posture, and of course your wrist, carpal tunnel, you know, that you can you can get all these things. These are things that have not at, ended professional careers. Uh, so thinking about researching and putting together a stretch out stretch routine that you would have your players and student staff do before every practice. And if you start with a club, before they, they even get in front of the keyboard, this is you have them, you go through whatever that routine is going to be so that they are more limber and reduced chance of injury. Um, so office workers, the huge piece. And then tryouts, I know, thinking about what are you looking for your trial process? And these are, these are just suggestions to, to think about and consider. Uh, in terms of what do you, you know, what are you looking at? Uh, there's, there's, I'm not going to name the college, but there's a college that uh, one of my kids went to, uh, and they had a League of Legends team that was, they, 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 they were, uh, there's the national tournament, and if I understand, there's a regional tournament, and they are one, they were playing a best of five, and they were one game, it was like two, two games to two, last game and if they win the game they go into the national tournament like they're like in there with the big dogs and and they lost and one of the things that that was challenging for them was that their top laner because five people on legal legal legends team their top laner who was their best um um player you know when you look at solo queue i, I, I don't know what it might have been diamond or he might have been higher than that um was a toxic player and just was really, you know, challenging to the rest of the team where the rest of the team would just shut down if, if or you wouldn't listen. Um, and the coach said after that, that season, I will not keep that player on the team. Next year, that player is off the team. And you think about, wow, if, you, if you're, if baseball is solo queue, you have one one of the top individually talented players on the team, and then you choose not to because of their behavior, you know, those are decisions you have to make. Um, so when you think about trial process, which we'll get into more depth about that later on, these are things to think about. And you might decide to jump into that. That's why these, these are things you might consider in, in, around that. Technical support is more of a district level IT piece. It's about a lot about filtering and um, your, your, your uh, network. Uh, these are suggestions from one IT um, director in, in Texas uh, who uh, has a thriving esports program at their school district. And these are things that they would look at um, as part of the process. So anyway, as you know, someone, any of you who are just thinking about where to start, th this is a checklist you'll be able to explore. Um, and then I want to share with you this one is, is for all of you again, but this is the one that veteran coaches might be of particular interest, but even those of you who are just starting. And so we look at this checklist and what we can see here is this is just like what, you know, just think about what do you should have in place? What are your considerations? So again, you know, establishing a gamer code of conduct. What is that gamer code of conduct going to look like that you're going to have your students sign off so that you can use that as part of your coaching conversation. So if students break a norm or break a, a, a expectation of gamer code of conduct, that's not a disciplinary conversation initially, unless it's really a really serious issue. It's a coaching conversation with the student to have them reflect on what they did and think about what to do next. So like, for example, when I ran that summer camp, um, communication was a big focus of our work. And at one point, there was these two students that sitting in a, game, at a, a computer side by side, yelling at each other 
but wouldn't make eye contact. They're, they're staring at the game. They're playing the game and yelling at each other. And I had to tell them, stop. I pulled them both off the game, went out in the hallway, and I had and I asked them questions to help them. It's you know to not about the situation at first, but their communication because that was the big key problem. They couldn't solve their own problem because they weren't listening to each other, uh, and and so we leveraged the gamer code of conduct for that. And they and these were middle schoolers, and they immediately settled down and they talked it through. And once they were their 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 choice in communication and then they were able to resolve their issue and didn't have the problem again so these are things you wanted to do and then your community agreements or your norms this is something you have your students create and this is these are the day the day guidelines where the gamer code of conduct is your your team overarching community guidelines any questions about the distinction between the two because these are they're related, but they're, they are, they serve two different purposes. So this is gonna be important to think about. You don't have to create the professional uh, agreements, but you are gonna to want to identify what steps you're gonna take in order to help you to facilitate your students creating that. Okay, equipment needs. These are just th different things to be thinking about. and. Fortunately, you have a, a district focus that has probably answered many of these questions already uh, that can, you'll be able to explore that uh, in that regards. And then we'll come back to this again for those of you who are part of the, the club um, growth, because with clubs, you're gonna want, like your team, you may not have switches, for example, but your club, you definitely wanna have some game consoles like switches because you can maximize more players playing on a switch or a control console than you can on a computer. The computer might have two people and they're sharing the keyboard and the mouse. Where a switch, you, a switch, you can have up to eight players on one switch. So when you think about how do I maximize participation, I mean that switches are three hundred dollars, so a fraction of the cost of a computer, a laptop even, and you can get more kids on. Um, so those are things to think about in that regard. Recruitment, who are you recruiting? Now you'll notice that there's these asterisks because if there's not, these are optional. So don't feel like I gotta get all these people <laughs> to do a team. Uh, Amazon Prime has them on sale, oh nice, because switches are rarely on sale. Um, but you know, players, you know, you're recruiting your players, your coaches, um, you need IT. These are student staff who are just, who are gonna set up the pre-game rituals, they, they set up the equipment, make sure everything's working for your players before they even start. Your production crew, which at minimum is who's gonna record or live stream the games. Um, you can have your players do it, but you really don't want them to focus on that. Nutrition, fitness, nutrition, it's important to have a, some plan. You know, this might be you, the coach, or you might have some people that you can, you can tap. And it's not that you're requiring kids to do this, this thing or that thing. It's suggestions and education that you might be doing at your level. And then the asterisks are just additional. Like scouts can literally be students who go to like Mobilytics or uh, OP.GG, and they're looking up the players of the team that you're about to play to see you know, what champions do they play? What, what are their tendencies? I mean, in some cases, they can actually watch VODs and capture VODs to share back for your, your teams to study. And that just depends on to what level. Year one, most of you may be like, no. I see Daniel's wheels are turning. He's already thinking, all right, I got, I got some people who are gonna be in my scouts. And, and these are students who are gonna be doing this. Assistant coaches can be students. They don't, I mean, if you can get more adults, that's great. But I know it's kind of, sometimes it's hard to get that. But the more students you get involved, the more sustainable your program is going to be because they will carry that knowledge forward and then they can train you know, the, you know, the younger kids who, who come, whether they're freshmen in high school or you know, in middle, middle school, the younger kids might, if they're, if, for example, um, if your ESRB rating is higher than the age of a student, so a student can't play a game because they're not old enough, could they then be a scout or assistant coach if they like that particular game? and be able to support that way. You know, there might be some parental sign-offs that have to happen. Content creators. I mean, you have kids who love the game, but do not like to play competitively. I call them our casual players. 
but would love to, to do the content production and do the editing around that or be the casters. They don't want to play. Either they don't want to play or they just can't make the team. It can be one or both. Sometimes they are really good players. You would prefer them to play, but they're not interested because to them it's too serious. There are gamers like that. There's like my son was on a team where the, the top laner in League of Legends quit the team because he said, this is too serious for me. I just want to have fun. I want to be casual. It's like, okay. But that person might want to be a caster, a color commentator. You know, we can leverage them in different roles. Um, and then journalism or marketers, if you're trying to, you know, showcase what you're doing so that you can get more uh, support from either the, the PTO or from the community. What Either, what what questions or observations do you have about this section? If you have been a coach or a sponsor of any school program, you have experience around some of these things. Um, so, what are what are some um, what are some thoughts you have? Either questions or observations, advice that would be beneficial to this group. And feel free to use the chat or the mic. Do you think a school district would allow us, um, I don't know if John is, is on the line, they would allow us to um, set up a our own uh, Discord? Mm, great question, John. Um, okay, so, and again, this is not me because I think Discord is one of the most important tools in gaming. Um, and again, this is not... Uh, not uncommon also in the K-12 world, but there are some pretty crazy things on Discord as well. So um, the official line from IT security is that um, teachers, coaches have access to Discord. So you should be able to log into Discord on your computer at any time. Students do not. And students uh, should use a personal device if they want to access Discord. So that's the official ruling from IT security. They don't want our students on our devices inside of Discord. I know that's difficult. Some of the leagues actually require Discord. Um, so, you know, that's why the, the, the compromise was adults can use it and students can use it on their personal devices, but not district computers. Unfortunately, Discord is there's an app for that, which I know all, you all know. But Nelly, you want to follow? Is there any follow up thoughts or questions about based upon that response? Is it the same thing for Twitch? Good question. So uh, you will be able to create your own Twitch channel. Um, so basically, part of the goal. I don't know if you talked about the whole ecosystem yet uh, of esports, but part of the goal will be to have people like shoutcasters and broadcasters. Um, and so what will happen is there's, there's a process. So basically you'll have a form, your principal will nominate whoever they want to be coaches. And that way I have a direct contact that the principal said, this is the coach. And then once we get to that point, each school has a unique email address that they'll be able to sign up for social media. So if they want, um, if you want a Twitter uh, feed for your team, if you want a, a uh, an Instagram, your Twitch channel, all of that will sign up through a specific email address that will then copy to your district email directly uh, if you were labeled as a coach from your principal. So, um, it's basically a group account that we then just, the mail all goes to those people in that group. Um, and that's also how you'll have to sign up for your uh, Nintendo Switch accounts if you get Switches. Nintendo is notoriously difficult uh, to work with when you're looking at scaling. Um, so like you'll have to have that email address and then you'll have to register it like 19 times if you have 19 Switches. So uh, that's all stuff we'll talk about later, but, but yeah, so... Um, so yeah, so there will be a process that you'll be notified and then Twitch is definitely something we are encouraging. We have, uh, most of the pilot schools are actually already streaming a lot of their matches, so yeah. Well, there is a question. I'm sorry, Nelly, does that answer that? Yes, thank you. Okay, great question. And 
So uh, Tina asked a question. And this is relevant to this whole conversation that we're in because we're talking about, John, I introduced like different checklists for coaches to think about for their setting up their teams. So that's what we're getting to the logistics is um, how many hours per week of a teacher's time will this involve? Um, and I have posted in the chat, you know, that it, it kind of depends on what works for you as a staff and what the district expectation is, i.e. John will pitch it, jump into that in a moment. Um, and then, you know, my personal view, just as a context, and I share this because again, you might say, oh my gosh, that's a Michigander statement. So that's okay. Is um, I like to think of, I think of esports teams as like traditional esports, traditional teams. And when I ran, you know, practices for basketball, volleyball, and track, they were two hour practices. I mean, you just need the time to, to work on things. And, uh, and then we had, we had uh, official game days, either it's once a week or twice a week. And so it's just like, you really needed that time for practices. With that said, there are schools that do two hour practices. There are schools that do one hour practices. So let me stop there. John, what's, what's your take? And then Daniel, let's hear it from you as well, since you did this last year, what did you actually do? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's how much you want to put into it. I think your kids would tell you they would meet with you every day after school if you uh, if you let them. Um, and so, so for example, in the pilot, one of the schools, the teacher just met once a week with the kids, but at Palm Beach Lakes, they were after school every single day. And so they were enough, they had done enough though to get noticed by someone, a funder, and they were able to get a half a million dollars of funding for next year, for the next three years. So because he put in all the work the past two years, now he's gonna kind of get rewarded for that work. So. You know, what I what I would typically say is working with your principal to get like a club stipend or something like that, because right now, uh, esports is not a sanctioned sport in in um, in Florida. So my goal is to make it a uh, sanctioned sport. So I, I'm trying to meet with the people at the FSHAA to make it a sanctioned sport. Um, and if that happens. Esports will then slide in under athletics. Now, granted, there are lots of different things if you're in athletics versus a club, but you know the thing with athletics is there's a lot more money. So that's kind of what we're trying to work with. Um, but yeah, you know, you may want to meet two times a week if you're really into com competing. Um, Palm Beach Lakes went and competed in the nationals in Orlando a couple weeks ago. And literally, he had his kids at that school every day at 10 a.m. since the last day of school. And they were practicing all the way up through mid-June um, every day to prepare for national. So, you know, it's, it's really a, a your choice kind of a thing and how much you want to invest time in it. But just know you're going to have a lot more kids that want to join your club than you're going to probably be able to handle on your own. Um, so some of the schools have decided to like cap membership because they just can't handle it. Others have added a couple of different sponsors. So there's more than one teacher so they can kind of lighten the load. Uh, but yeah, the kids want this dramatically. And ideally what will happen is your principal will see that and they'll be more interested in providing you funding and, and getting you stuff so that you can continue to expand. Great, John. And you know what? I just was adding that, you know, there's an important distinction between a club and a team. And so, and these are some things I'm sure all of you are thinking about because a club might meet just once a week, you know, because it's, it's for casual and casual competitive experiences that you will be using, you know, likely esports titles, but also titles that may not be, you know, part of the official competition, but fulfill, still fit within your guidelines for appropriate games to play uh, for students to explore. Whereas a team is usually is, is competing against other schools, whether on a weekly basis or through tournaments. And so then at that point is it's like, do you shove just for, for, for the competition and, and hope your kids are practicing or do you establish practices? And, and how you establish practice, maybe it's just 
once a week in addition to the day of competition. And if that's what works for you initially, then, then go with it. I mean, that's, that's your bandwidth. It gives kids some access um, and then grow from there. Um, kind of a, <laughs> just to give you a traditional sport example. One year I was, um, I was the, the, we call the frost off basketball coach, which is for basically freshmen and sophomores. So it wasn't the varsity team for girls. And it was a school that um, what happened was the, the boys got priority, which is such an equity issue, where essentially I got, I got the gym three times a week. So I got Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The boys, in addition to their other gym time, got the gym Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Plus, they had another gym as well. So they were getting five days a week. I was getting just three days a week. Um, in the gym. And I asked the girls, I said, what did you guys do last year? They said, well, the coaches gave us the time off. So we only met three times a week. And I said, no, no, no. We're meeting Tuesday, Thursday. And what we did was our school was so big. Our hallways were big. Is that I, I, we had, it was, there's th four stories. I took them on the third, the third floor of, of the school where it was quiet and we ran drills. We ran, we did what we call game mechanics. And we just practiced those game mechanics for two hours um, because that's what we needed to do. Now, that example is not to say to you, you got to do this five days a week. What that example is intended to say is if you have limited time, you say, I got one day outside of competition to meet with them. That's okay. Then just adapt your practice for that one day. Or if you say, I only got 30 minutes, I can do 30 minutes three times a week for practice. That's fine. Then adapt for the 30 minutes each day of how you're going to do things because it's at that, it just gives the kids that, that needed time to get better as a group. It might be, this is the time we do um, team uh, macro practice and I'm going to give you, with the help of my players, assignments of what I want you to practice on your own time. So you make those adaptations. Any other thoughts or ideas about this? Questions or comments? Or challenges? Like, this is great, but here's a challenge, I think. Here's the reality of where I'm at. Because you're probably not the only one who's facing that reality. And this is our time together to navigate that so that we can see what's best for the, for the work you do in the schools. So I'm just trying to understand why is it that you need such a big area to practice? You mean for basketball? No, no, no. I mean, you were just giving the example of, of a real athletic team. Yeah. Is that what you were saying? Oh, okay. That was, How, yeah. That was, that's you... that. <laughs> oh, okay. No, 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 no. Yeah. yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I know that they, I know that there's some universities that go out and, and they, um, do competitions with schools and stuff for esports, and they do it all in the uh, in the gymnasium and everything. Yeah, so yeah. that's why yeah. I, was I, I think the equivalent would be: let's say you want to practice five days a week, but there's there's no official space, like on two of the days. Then it might be just find a classroom or find find some space somewhere in the building where you guys can sit, huddle up together, and and do what you got to do. Um, I mean, I know some schools where there's one teacher, what he does is he says three days a week, he meets with the school, the students first thing in the morning before school even starts and they get, they have 30 minutes. And, and he does that because he does not have time after school to meet with them. And then there's one day, I think it's Friday that after school, he's got a, bu a bulk of time and that's like their official meeting, but they meet in the mornings the other time. So you find what works for you and it will be beneficial for your kids. And, and just know, this, you guys are in the pioneer stage of your program. So you're, you're, you're building that value meaning for your stakeholders so that you get to a place where, um, you know, the funding, the structures, the supports um, have evolved um, to a place where you think it might need to go. And that's why I said it's also important to focus maybe on one, maybe two games. Like, yes, you know, yes. at Palm Beach Lakes, they've got Rocket League and they've got chess. 
Um, and the reason they have chess is that they lost their coach last year. And so the kids saw that the chess teacher, uh, the, the, that the leagues were actually offering competition for chess last year. And so they asked the chess teacher to join the esports team. And so, you know, that's kind of how they got started. And then they actually were able to compete in chess as well. So, um, you know, so that's really, you know, starting bite size because it gets overwhelming quickly if you have multiple games going on, trying to keep track of that, and you want to do some social media and shoutcasting and all of this, like, it adds up quickly uh, in the amount of time that, that's required. And, and fortunately, I, I, and John, you can speak to the, the experience there, but typically the, 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 the titles that are focused on are based on seasons. So like, for example, Rocket League, I don't know, might be in the spring and League of Legends might be in the fall. So if you if you focus on just two titles, that's how you might do it. Say, okay, I'm focusing season one, it's this title. Season two, it's with this title. So that just to kind of manage and get that experience um, with that. And again, in the first year, maybe the first two years, it's finding the students who can actually do the coaching and then you are you're kind of like their co-coach which means you're still there at the session so you can monitor and manage classroom management pieces with them while they're doing the practices which means you now if they're if they're getting a little bit toxic or or spicy you know you have to coach them what what does professional communication look like because that's what you expect in practices, because what they do in practice, they're going to do in competitions. All right. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, obviously making sure that it's a safe space for all students. Um, you know, there's a survey that I'll be able to share with you guys in, in August. You can survey your students with. And, um, you know, when the kids filled that out the first time, I did have a couple of kids in the comments section ask, like, is it going to be a safe space for females? And, mm. and you know, we have a really big goal of trying to have 25% female participation. So, but they know the regular esports world is toxic to females. Um, also had a student in the LGBTQ spectrum and said the same thing, like, is it going to be safe for me to be there or not? So you, as the, the person in the front of the room, need to make sure that all kids are, are welcome there into those clubs because, and this is some of the stuff I've gotten pushed back from our own leadership in the district about the toxicity in the pro level um, towards females and other groups. And, you know, the only way, and they ask, how can we change that? And I, I don't think we can change that. We can only educate the next generation going up that's going to compete in those with how to behave themselves but you also see the toxic behavior in regular pro sports like football and basketball and all that stuff too. So, you know, it's, it's really important to keep that as an expectation up front. So I want to emphasize something that John said, because it is about locus of control. And what you have control of is what John was saying. is like the culture that you establish in your grade level, your school around this is preparing the next group of not just players, but just participants in, in casual gaming and in the workplace. Uh, and so that's, that's what's so important as a part of this. So when we get into these different groups, uh, minority groups, because it, it, it's not their job, the minority groups are to educate. It's our job to educate everyone as part of the community. Um, so establishing, that's why you establish the Gamer Code of Conduct, you establish those norms, and then you come back and revisit those both um, at every meeting, to not, not to read through, but to reflect around, like, how are we doing in this area, and blah, 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 in that regards. Um, and this is why it's important to create an intentional recruitment plan, because we can say we're, we're available for everybody, we're open to doing that. It is likely if that's all we do, you're not going to get a lot of girls participating. You might not get a, a lot of LGBTQ plus students. You might not get some other students or uh, that really represents your group unless you think about how I'm going to do outreach to students and what does that need to look like in order to do that. Um, because I've, I've 
I hear numerous stories of, for example, of, of having an, an informational session and, and they'll say, a watch girl has come to the door who I've talked to. They come to the door, they look inside, they see all these boys and they walk away. So how, how are we going to, you know, those are things you have to, to work, work out. Uh, let's see. The other sports are not co-ed. Do esports teams have to be co-ed? Well, it's other sports we know aren't co-ed for different reasons. There, there's not the same reason why esports teams can't be co-ed because the skills and abilities are the same. There's no there's no advantage, gender advantage um, per se. Uh, with that said, um, there are programs, you know, down the road that you might explore, like Girls Who Game, that deal you know, to help with bringing girls in. But their their big purpose is to bring girls in to eventually be to mainstream into the larger group. Um, so you might have a varsity team that is. Hopefully, we can get a mixed group of kids involved, but. Maybe when you do your initial trials, that's just not the case. You know, the, the skilled players with good behavior just happen to be male. Then if you have um, your JV teams, and then that's the place where you could say, okay, I got JV teams. I can, I can make whatever mix I want. I got two JV teams. Maybe I might have one that's all girls and one that's boys. It's the kind of, that, that's the decision that you, you make. Here's a new one to try out. Since we're kind of looking at that, you can see the list right there. I won't read it to you. You can see what's there. But if there are times that you have sports, and this happens a lot, I, I hear the same story where we want to start a League of Legends team, but we only have three players who actually have experience and we don't have two more experienced players to be on the team. And the kids are like, we need two more. How can we recruit it? And what they do is they'll find two kids who are like, yeah, you know, I've never played League of Legends, but I like gaming and I'm willing to give it a try if you'll teach me and it means I'm on the varsity team. So cool, I'll do it. If your three kids hypothetically are all boys, you need two new new players. Why not actively reach out to some girls or just our other other kids since you're gonna have rookies anyway? Why do they, I mean, if you say to those three boys, can you go find someone, guess who they're gonna find and bring back? Two boys. And I'm not saying you exclude them from, from still consideration. I, I'm just saying it's an opportunity that to bring in and have a mix. So it's, there, it's go ahead, John. No, I was just gonna say, and there's other opportunities, uh, not as the player again, thinking of the whole ecosystem where, where girls, can come in and are could be more interested. So like at Lakes, for example, um, they have someone who's in charge of their social media and she came, and, but she said, I, I don't like gaming. I don't know anything about gaming, but I'm interested in social media and that's what I want to go to college for. And so that's a great way to get experience. So she came in, she'd been taking pictures, she'd been doing their Instagram and their Twitter. Um, and one of my goals was to try to get her to go to Orlando with the team so she could then document the process. We just didn't get enough funding to get her up there this year. But, you know, it, it, it's there are other aspects to it. Thinking about going to your art classes, their, your Adobe Photoshop classes, because you're going to need digital graphics. You're going to need a logo. Like, you can get those things from other groups in the school that may not be typically interested in gaming, per se but they want to be a graphic designer. Well, great. You can design our graphics for Twitch or, you know, our, our t-shirts or whatever. Um, those opportunities are available. Yeah, well, good points about all the different roles. And this goes to your student staff. How do you recruit your student staff to be a part of it? So this is the trial process. And we're gonna come back to this tomorrow, like really dive into this, you know, so you can kind of think about that piece. And then, you know, these are just about, um, you know, what are the things we want students to actually learn through the experience of gaming and being on student staff because there are, there are similarities. But particularly with the players themselves, you know, one difference with esports and traditional sports is with traditional sports, once you know the rules, it's set. There's nothing's going to change. But when you're playing an eSport, there's patch notes because patch, there's always patches that changes the games. Um, you know, there's meta changes. I mean, there's, there's things that just, you, 
that you have to be constantly a student about. And then there's some things we need to work on. Yeah, bug changes. Um, you know, mental tenacity and patience, that's up there number one because that, I mean, you think about your players. You know, it, you know, if you play casually, if you ever felt frustrated or been on a team with friends who are getting frustrated, who start spamming the quit button, they quit the game, start a new one, um, that's mental tenacity and patience. I mean, I can't tell you, I mean, there are games that really get out, snowball out of control, you know, it's lost. Okay, we, we quit early. But there have been games that I know I've been part of where we're we're down 10, ga- 10 gold, 10K gold, and we're down um, something like by 10, 10 kills, and we still end up winning the game. I mean, it's it's just how do you how do you handle that? Uh, and and just the, the rest of these are, are a lot of things about knowledge about the game, and just know that the rules routinely change. <laughs> you know, with the patch notes, you know, and and depending on how often a, a game gets patched will determine how often the rules change. Uh, and what you do. So students need to be really like learners around that, as well as as coaches, we need to be learners around that. Now, again, those of you who are just starting, I say as coaches, you need to be learners around that. It doesn't mean you're gonna know as anywhere near as much as the players initially, but you just want to just be an active listener to that. Those of you who actually play, some of you might notice you guys already play some of these games. You understand what I'm saying about how you can, can continue to grow yourself as a player as you're helping your players explore that as well. And then this is talking about practice structure. There's a template. We're going to dive into this template later on. But if you want a sneak peek, this is just a suggestion. It's not something you have to follow. It's when you look at the template from my veteran coaches, look less at how things are broken out and more on what is the focus, which is essentially this list. These are things that should be part of your practices. Ideally, every practice. But it's possible that some of these things, because you don't have enough time to get them all in one practice that you do in some practices, but like stretches should be in every practice. You know, and then as far as are you doing mechanics, are you doing game knowledge, macro micro play, you know, maybe some things you're doing every day, like mechanics might be every day, but macro micro play might be, you know, twice or once a week. And competition day, what's your routine? You guys ever gone to a basketball game and doing warm-ups and you see what they do or football game, you see warm-ups and the team captain is running the team through warm-ups? What is your warm-up that your team captain is going to run? What are your expectations about when kids have to show up? Um, so those who, I think, Daniel, you compete, you did competition. Did you notice that, did you win any games by forfeit because the other team didn't show up to compete? Actually, uh, I used to run tournaments at a <clears throat> convention local by and the surprising amount of people that get by first round because they their opponents just don't show up is hilarious. I had yep. one tournament of um, 120 people signed up and almost 40 didn't show up for their call times. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so that's so as a coach, we have leverage and influence with our, our players. So just think about you know, establish little expectations because in traditional sports, if it's a home game, I mean, if it's a away game, it's like you got to be at the bus at a certain time. If it's a home game, there's always an expectation that kids have to be there early. Um, and part of that is so that the coach knows that I got a team the field. <laughs> I got, I got, and so you want to think about what is your expectation so that whatever it is, add more time to that, like 15, 20 minutes so that, you know, if I want the, if I say, I want you to hear an hour, um, you know, I want them to hear 45 minutes uh, early, then I might say I want them an hour early so that after 15 minutes and I still got two players not there, I can reach out to them and figure out what's going on and try to address it before we get into crunch time. And the kids just get used to it. And then you just have a routine that you want them to do while they're there. Like the first step might actually be fuel up. You know, you pack pack some snacks and eat your snacks, and then we're gonna go into stretches. And then we're gonna play, if it's league, we're gonna we're gonna play a couple of ARAMs to get ready. If it's Rocket League, we're gonna play a couple of casual matches. There are three-minute matches just to get ourselves warmed up for um, you know, so we're ready to go. 
So whatever the routine is, you, you create that routine, or if you're not familiar with the game, you facilitate your, your team captains to create the routine. And you say, what should we do for warm ups when they're playing the game? How can we how can we play the game before our actual competition to warm up? What can we do? They'll tell you. They'll be able to tell you some options. Daniel, did you have any type of game day routine? Mostly when it comes to my tournament experience, it's more on the organizer side of running the tournament rather than dealing with players because this was before mm -hmm. I became a teacher. Uh, but it was mostly just making sure equipment set up and everything works and every setup is on the right rules, on the right settings. Everyone's got everything they need. Um, and mainly understanding and organizing the bracket, which is equally as important. I see, Angela, you said before class, we would do an ARAM. I don't, can you do ARAM Clash? Gosh, I'm, oh, Clash, Clash. That, that, that's the legal one. I was thinking Clash of Clans. That makes, that, that's a great, great, great share, Angelica. I mean, so that's, those are things that you want to have established. You want that routine so that you're not the team. So you are the team who's ready to win by forfeit because you're there. But also more importantly, that your team is not the cause of the game not happening, if that happens. And then the last thing is content production. And again, at minimum, who's going to record the games? The difference between live streaming, let me ask, I'll put it out there. Is anyone, why would some schools prefer, prefer to record their games rather than to live stream their games? I would say maybe even just to avoid uh, community noise and you know if they're not if students aren't playing well they aren't able to check the chat and see you know comments in the chat about oh maybe they suck or this and that or critique and stuff uh, that would get them more down or it's and, also and less stressful. You, you make a great point Daniel because um, that actually happened while we were in Orlando with EGF um, one of the players wasn't doing that great and they obviously the kids couldn't see the chat but you know the 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 coaches and and the the kid coach had it up and you know it is kind of disrespectful and it's hard to police what other people are going to say especially if you're live on twitch like you know you can block them or ban them or whatever but those words do hurt and so you know they they need to understand is it that that resilience the kids need to get the resilience so it may be better not to be live streaming if you know you know a student is may not be there they may be more sensitive to that kind of stuff you know yeah absolutely and i see uh tina in case of something inappropriate and and that, and that usually comes to if you have casters and they're casting the game and they get so excited about great play and they drop the f-bomb and it's like oh type of thing, um, uh, issues, and like I said, to avoid issues and to have a record of issues. Because uh, oftentimes, yeah, like I said, there's no recording of the player's talk because that, that's that's not part of it. You just see the game happening with the fog of war or, uh, or sometimes not with the fog of war if you want to show the whole thing. Um, but particularly with um, casting, what some schools have done is when they're in their initial years is that cast, everything's recorded and then, then the casters do the recording, uh, do the voiceover afterwards um, so that they can edit out, you know, if there's anything inappropriate and then it's uploaded. The idea is like within, you know, two to three days, we're gonna upload the game so people can actually see the game that happened. Um, if they live stream without the, um, without casting, you might still record it and then the casters would do a, a cover of it and then that gets goes up. Um, the benefits of live stream, of course, is that it, it gives community members and parents immediate opportunity to watch their, their games. And a lot of times these, these games are set on delay. Um, but I get to your point about social media chat that you can't control what people say during that chat. But, the, but, that, not, but that is likely a, a separate coaching piece for your players. You know, one is don't look at social media about your play <laughs> because all the trolls come out and they're not 
they're not constructive or helpful and they're not intended to be constructive or helpful. So there's no point in reading up the feed later on or reading the comments later on because it's just not worth the time. Um, so, all right, so this is, this is the list. This is something to help you think through these are these two lists of what you might be doing. Um, um, yeah, actually, a good point about adult mo moderating the live stream. Uh, that's important because you can kick people out for being inappropriate. And then also you can create filters. Um, you can do that as well. So there's a lot to, to consider. And so I want to pause here. And I'm going to give you guys um, uh, about 25 minutes to do some work around around your team. So what does this work look like? You know, where do you start? Because like, oh my gosh, like so man, most of you, you're just getting started with this. Like, well, where do I start? So there's a couple starting points. So first is thing you're gonna do is I'd like you to just take a moment and just do another skim read, looking at this and see what part stands out to you. Let's get a skim read of that or look at this checklist and say, what part stands out to you? And then if you if you feel overwhelmed, like if you have a place to start, go ahead and start. If you feel overwhelmed, then just start with the Gamer Code of Conduct and it can, you know, just this piece, like what do you think would be important? As well as, um, you know, just think about how you're going to communicate about your, your, your sport. Now you're not gonna work individually. I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms um, and I'm gonna change the breakout rooms a little bit. I'm going to let you choose your rooms and I'm going to form um, two rooms so you can balance between the two. And the thing is you can work individually, but I'd like you to be in a room so that that way, if you have questions, you can ask them. And if, you, if someone, or if someone has a question, you can, you can answer the question or help them think it through. Um, and then I will be available in the main room just to answer if you want to talk to me or just you know, just send me a, in the chat or whatever, and I'll be happy to jump in. And just in case, um, boy, this is kind of scary. I'm gonna <laughs> actually this 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 will, yeah I was just what the heck. Um, I'll put you can send me a text and. If, if I, and, and I'll jump into the room and say, hey, John, come to room one or come to room two and I'll jump in and, and then answer questions you have um, for, for me. Okay, are there any questions about the directions? You're just doing some initial thinking ideation about your team and, and starting to build a structure. You have John and I as guides. All right, I'm going to open the rooms and when I open them, you have until 11, 55. One thing I actually wanted to ask was when it comes to Nintendo Switches and recording mm -hmm. stuff, whether it be for live stream or just recording in general, um, do you know what's the best way to go about that? Because I know Nintendo is still, once again, notorious about being able to to record their devices, whether it need like a separate recording device or. Uh, yes, there's, that? oh, I wish I could remember what it's called. It's a little HDMI thing. Like the Elgato's. Have, say it again. Elgato. I know that was an older one for other Nintendo ones, but I think. Yeah, I heard some a people capture card. That's what I think it's called. A yeah, capture, capture card. cards. Yeah. So basically that's how you would have to do if you wanted to stream anything on Switch. Mm -hmm. Now, okay. I guess technically you could stream it to, you could plug it into a monitor or uh, like I'm thinking if you plug it into the smart panel with the computer there, but it's going to use the HDMI so you won't be able to stream it through the computer on there. So no, you, you need some sort of card that's going to let you do that. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, because the only other option, I mean, that'd be the best for clear view. The only other option would be to actually set up a camera or a phone onto your screen <laughs> and and record that way. Which, well, you know, if if it comes down to brass tacks and it's needed, we'll do it. But everyone, <laughs> those it's are not, notorious. It's not the cleanest. Yeah, 
Yeah. Exactly. All right. Thank you. Yep. If we were to start um, like the esports thing before we get some kind of funding to get us switches, if we wanted to bring our own um, switch, are we going to have any issues with setting it up because it has our personal email on it? It's not so much setting it up. I mean, the kid will own their own switch. So, you know, that'll still be their account on there. Um, the only issue will you will run into is IT related problems. So, um, you know, and that's something we'll go through in August and September. But basically, one of the first steps that you'll have to do is request a work order for IT to install a special piece of hardware at your school. It's down to a science where basically it makes one room separate from the whole school. So it takes it off of the school's network and creates a gaming lab network. And then with the switch specifically, you do have to hardwire it in our network. We could not get it to work on, on Wi-Fi just because of how challenging our Wi-Fi always is in our district. Um, so there's like an adapter that you have to buy for the switch to, to plug the base into <clears throat> the ethernet. And then as long as that's plugged into the switch that the network switch that IT installs, then you'll be able to play. We are still having issues playing school to school. So if Palm Beach Lakes wants to play Palm Beach Central, we're having an issue right now. Um, IT has two of our switches and they're trying to figure out if something Nintendo does, it's a Nintendo thing that's not standard in the industry. So, um, but we're hoping to have that solved by the beginning of school. Okay, sounds great, thanks. Okay. All right, so we're, 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 we're about to break for a 30 minute lunch. And um, uh, before we go, just wanna do a quick like reflection about the morning. And basically in three words or less, you only get up to three words, no more than three words, but you can use one word. Um, how would you describe your understanding how, of esports, um, or just just the work that we're doing about teams. Um, how how are you feeling about it? Let me so let me start again. In three words or less, how are you feeling about um, your um, your journey towards starting an esports team? And you can you can post in the chat or use the mic. Fire hose of information. <laughs> Excited. Construct additional pylons. That's a new one for me. Yeah, right. That's a new one for me too. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, obviously this is the competition training we're going through the two days for coaches. So competition obviously is a lot more involved um, related to what Charles is saying, you know, it is a lot of commitment to create a team. Think about football. They practice every day after school and, and their games are Friday nights and then they're, you know, reviewing the plays over the weekend. Um, so, you know, this one, maybe John and I didn't plan it great. We should have maybe did the club one first and not scare them as much because it's a little more <laughs> laid back. Um, but you may start with a club, you know, and not go straight into competing or maybe doing informal competition, but yeah, it is a lot, but one step at a time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And and, and that's, this is for those of you who might decide, you know what, I, I may not start with a team, but at least now I know more about what goes into it and what's needed. When we get into the club, you're gonna, like, like John, you're just saying, it's, it's a great entryway to this process. And maybe you might say, that's all I wanna do, um, but the clubs can be a great, um, way to bring more students in who might eventually play on the team. Um, so good, this is, this is good. I see raise the money, lots of commitment to be determined, fair, better informed. 
Um, so we're going to take a lunch break and it's now 12 o'clock. We're going to come back together at exactly 1231. So I'll see you guys in 30 minutes. Have a good lunch break. There we go, the right one, there we go. <clears throat> okay, we're back. Okay. Well, just making sure since a lot of people have their screens turned off, if you just post in the chat that you are present. Um, appreciate that. And hmm, we're going to jump into this. Let's check one thing here. Here we go. Yep. All right. So one of the things we uh, we didn't do in the morning that we're going to kind of do right now is um, you'll see culture building and you'll see there's a link that says case study review. If you go to the case study review, you'll see case study one. That's the one we're going to focus on. And I'm showing this to you because you're going, um, um, just going to kind of reflect on this. So, and then I'm going to put you into two breakout rooms. So you're going to reflect, you're going to discuss it as a group, and then we're going to come back and we're going to share um, your find what, what your your takeaways were. And I ask you to have a different um, spokesperson for each of the, the reflection prompts. Yes, recreate the rooms here, sign automatically. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> All right, so like I said, this is the case study and case study one in 2013, team solo MEBD. This is not solo mid, this is actually a different team. We're to play in the League of Legends Championship Series uh, European qualifiers. However, Tribunal formed by Riot, the game publisher, found out that several members of Team Solomedi had expressed behavior that was considered toxic. This was during gameplay. The behaviors including, included using different accounts to threaten players and Riot employees, as well as using slurs, engaging in cyber attacks and in-game verbal abuse. Um, Riot responded to these behaviors by banning the offending players, some temporarily and some permanently, as the team coach discussed the following points. And so you're going to look at these options here in terms of, you know, what are ways of monitoring your team's behavior during scrimmage in public games and streaming? Um, and as a coach, what's the best possible way of communicating to your players, you know, behavior that's unacceptable? Uh, and just how, how you might use the Gamer Code of Conduct to support that conversation? And how can you nourish a team environment where your players actively monitor and dissuade each other from engaging toxic behavior, where they're actually monitoring each other. So that's what you're going to be doing in your breakout room is having that conversation. And I just realized to help support that conversation. Um, oops. <clears throat> I'm going to include here our gamer code of conduct to use that as a reference point. Any questions about the directions? Okay. Once you're in your groups, you're going to have um, you're going to have four minutes to talk uh, and just thinking about. Actually, we'll say five minutes to talk and and consider each of these um, points during those that conversation. All right. Your rooms are open.
Well, for the. Hey, John. Hey. Hey, I gotta go out. So I'm gonna have to watch the rest. I don't think my cell phone's gonna work. So well, I'll, I'll have to watch the rest um, on, on the recording. Okay, whatever you need to do. Thanks for attending. Oh, you're welcome. It's been great. I, I wish I didn't have to, but I'm gonna try and log on when I uh, get to the office, but I don't think it's gonna work. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. You too. All right. Bye bye. <clears throat> okay. So, taking a look at this case study, um, like for each group to kind of share. Just what were, what were some um, ideas or, or decisions that or recommendations that you had based upon this, if this similar situation were to happen or to avoid such a situation happening with your team? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Is, uh, like each group to summarize what were their takeaways um, uh, based upon the conversation you had. I think from group one, one of our biggest takeaways was wanting to try to find some sort of reward system to reward good behavior, uh, rewarding students that are the upstanding students looking out for their uh, teammates and also, you know, winning with sportsmanship. That's the word I was forgetting <laughs> during uh, our talk. Uh, being able to not tear down other teams, win and, you know, walk over, give the handshake, the fist bump, um, and be nice about it. Great. How about team two? I think we've got Charles and Tina. Let me check my chat up here. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Charles says in the chat, uh, first we would have all the members play a co cooperative game together, um, TV to build com camaraderie and team building, like Minecraft or League of Legends. Yeah, yeah, that would be... Um, um, that's a great way to, to start the process. Um, um, I once in the, in the when I did the esports camp um, to help build that community, we played a game called Over Overcooked. And if you're any familiar with that game, that's where um, students are in teams or in the kitchen and they have to basically prepare meals and expedite it um, before it fell apart. And and we threw them in the game without any directions for one round to see what they would do and. And then we use that after the first round to debrief what happened. Uh, you know, and this kids, some of the kids were very frustrated. And we talked about communication. Uh, like, for example, you know, you, you didn't know what to do. So did you ask for help? No. Oh, you figured out what to do. Did you share that information with your team members? No. Okay. Well, so both sides of the coin of communication. And they, they played another round with that in mind and their scores got better. Oh. And Charles added, uh, after step one, just play a cooperative game. Step two, then we would role play certain scenarios of examples about inappropriate behavior, help identify situations and avoid these behaviors within our group. Nice, nice. So yeah, so these are imp important things to do with your, your players because um, you can turn off chat or group chat. Uh, they don't need it if they're on a team because they're on voice with each other. They don't need to chat with the other team. 
Um, you can do those things, but there's still, you know, important things to, to go over and have them reflect on for before the game and after the game. You know, if they win, what's considered okay celebration and what's considered excessive or what's considered appropriate celebration, you know, in that process. Now, there are professional players who are, who some get critiqued with their approach to celebrating. Um, but those are things to, to think about. All right, good. So what we're going to do is um, we're now going to go to the second part of culture building, which is this section here. And what I want to share with this is that we have a variety of resources that you'll have, you'll get to explore. We're just kind of kind of talk about what their, what's their value pieces. So let me start with the strategy section and then I'll come back to this piece because there's some real value over here in this document that you're gonna to wanna to look at. So these are specific strategies. So Gamer Code of Conduct, you're gonna see this if you, if you participate in the club um, workshop, but if you wanna look at it sooner, this gives you an exact, a, um, a, a draft in a Google Doc of a Gamer Code of Conduct that you could just copy and paste over and use to revise and edit to suit either your school or to do it as a group. Um, this is a useful tool that you can help shape what is what your community is going to be look like. Um, then, you know, norms. We talk about creating norms with the students, but how do we do that? And by clicking this link, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to take you to uh, this page. You scroll down, you'll see this box, and it talks about steps for establishing norms. And then there's just some resources that talk about norms. Uh, so it's a nice way to have students craft what they feel is what is appropriate, what is observable positive behaviors that that they that they think will help support the team and the gaming experience. And, and that's why you want it in gamer language, not in classroom language. Um, this is why, for example, these norms are intended to be in gamer language. You know, show active listening, pay attention to self and others. So you're monitoring like how you're feeling. Seek to understand before being understood. You know, if someone says something, I right, say, I know, kind of think about what they have to say. Try to be your best self, have fun, play well with others. These are all in the context of a gamer. Um, so what would be your context for your, your, your team? Um, so that's norm. So if you, I'm sure this because when you have playing time, when you think about your culture and how you want to introduce this to your students, these are some things you can look at and start to map out how you want to launch this, whether it's for a club or for a team. Giving feedback. You know, that's a big challenge to giving feedback when we when students find it hard to give each other feedback because they, they think of the, the word critique as a bad word. Why are you criticizing me? Well, no, I'm not criticizing, I'm critiquing. How do we teach our students to do pot critiques? Well, it's just the idea of be constructive, specific, and kind. So if you click this resource, um, there's a couple of things. First of all, this whole section is about being constructive, specific, and kind. I mean, um, with approaches to doing that. And the idea is like, we wanna give feedback that's helpful. And if it's gonna be helpful, it's gotta be specific and using kind language. So, well, we don't need tough love. Like, I'm just gonna tell it like it is, you suck. Well, okay. <laughs> that's, that's not helpful, is it? Because all we hear. Instead, it's like, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna be, I'm not going to be brutally honest. I'm just going to be honest and say that, you know, when you're playing a, a bit um, passive um, and we need to get you more active or you're, you're, we, need, we need to increase your activeness in the laning phase or in, in the, um, the ball handling in Rocket League, you tend to sit back. And so we need to figure out how to help you move forward. That's better than saying, you know, you play scared. You know, you, you got to stop playing scared. Well, that's not helpful. That doesn't tell me what I need to do. And I'm using language that I'm going to get defensive about. Um, so one of the ways we can teach our students to do this is these phrase called, I notice, I wonder, and what if. And so this is, actually, this is something that's used in critique protocols for reviewing 
writing and prototypes, uh, both at school level and in the professional level. Uh, I've done this both with adults and students. So we use the phrase, I notice, when we want to point out something that is potentially a problem or issue or a gap. I say potentially because in my head, I think it's not potential, it is. But by, by, but by using I notice, it gives the person, the receiver of the critique, the space to accept or reject it. So we begin the phrase with, I notice that you seem to play, you play, you play back when um, it might be helpful if you were playing more active or playing more forward. So it, it, see how, just how it frames. It's still saying the same thing, being concrete and specific and getting feedback. I wonder statement is when, um, you know, in this case, what, what, and also I know this can also be a positive too. You can be, hey, I, I wonder, I noticed that you did this really well, blah, blah, blah. I wonder statements is where you are, are is this where you are folks, sorry, I, I kind of mix things up. I notice statements is noticing something that is working, that's present by mistake. Um, because they need, players need to hear what they're doing well, or at least what they're doing okay. Because if you're thinking as a coach, oh my gosh, they're doing nothing well. They just, in League of Legends, they had like 20 deaths in the first 10 minutes. All right, well, and, and they just kind of stood there. You might say, hmm, I noticed that you consistently came right back to lane as quickly as you could. All right, well, that's a positive. Um, I wonder if the gaps, I wonder um, if, um, I wonder how you can be, how we can work on being more aware of the, look, the positioning of the opposing team so you don't walk right up to them. So you think, I wonder, so now they can engage in that. It's like, well, hmm, that's a good thing. I could do it this way, I could do it this way, as opposed to saying, you gotta stop walking right into the teams because you're dying too much. Well, that's not helpful. What ifs are suggestions. But again, we begin with the phrase, what if? So what if you did this or this or this? Just by phrasing is what if, it all these gives the receiver the option to turn it down. Now, likely if you're very specific, concrete and logical, they're not gonna turn it down without first considering it. And that's what the language does. And that can help them work on that. At first, it will sound a little bit awkward to them because they're not used to using that language, but I can tell you, in most cases, once as they keep doing this, like in bot reviews and practice, it just becomes part of the normal language. They just start using it elsewhere. Any questions or comments about this idea, either the idea of be specific, constructive, and kind, or the idea of the strategy of I know as I wonder is what is? Comments or questions? Okay, we have one more other strategy that you can use. And when we're talking about feedback, this is where I have a question. Out. Yes, go ahead. Um, do you have, other than that particular resource that you have there, do you have something like a slideshow or something that we can use with our students so that they can, you know, follow as a guideline of how you know, what things they should say and, and things like that, and, and that give us examples for them, for us to be able to go through that with them. Um, kind of like do what you what you guys were saying um, initially, where you were talking about the students being able to, um, like what you did with the students was able to play the game initially, um, the overcooked game, and then you sort of um, went to debrief about what went wrong and you know what did you do, whatever, and how did you come to the, the conclusion or whatever. Besides that particular you know, thing, doing a game and doing all that, do you have any other materials that we could use with the students to kind of tie along with that? So I do with, the, um, there's two sources that we do. I, I don't have the slides for this, but this is on my own website. So feel free, you have my permission, this is being recorded. <laughs> you have my permission to literally copy and paste this into a slide and, and revise the wording if you so desire to use with your students. Um, but when we talk about, I'll give you a sneak preview of this. When we talk about the, um, 
club, if you can come to the club workshop, we have a whole guide that has it includes um, the first four calm lesson plans for the club. And in that, the first couple lessons, it uses that exact recommendation that I talk about overcook, although you can do other games in place of that. And it walks you through, here are the steps that you can do. So that is available. What is also available, which we're gonna, you're gonna get a chance to explore it, is this here, the eSports Learning Guide for Teachers and Coaches. This has a series of modules. So let's just jump into it, why not? I had one more strategy to show, but I can come back to it. But if you go into this particular, um, okay, I need to download this so that I can look at it in PDF format because these are, there are, I don't think that, because the links don't work in this browser view. So let me just bring that here. Hold on a second. Oh, there we go. Uh, new share. All right, here we go. And of course, I'm trying to find the, here we go. All right, the reason I wanna do this is, this is a document that was created. Uh, I was the, the author of this for the work with Dell Technologies and Bench Learning Partnerships of creating modules. This is in part uh, primary intended for starting an elective course on esports to kind of help kids learn about esports through the experience of play. They're not just sitting in traditional learning, but they're actually play and they're learning. Uh, these modules, if you're familiar with project-based learning, each of these modules on their curriculum modules are unique um, ones where students get the experience um, while they actually produce content that's that's esports related. So in this case, this first module that I just jumped to is about creating culture building. And what it, you can and, and people who run clubs or teams actually pull some of these modules to use. So you ask, well, how can I can I use this now for a course? I just want to use it for my club or team. It will include like a suggested agenda, so it tells you what you can do, gives you links to resources. Um, explains, it gives you steps for how to accomplish it. Um, you know, I'm glossing through this, but you can look at closer read if you like to look at that. Like if you're looking, if you don't, you don't always have to use a game to do this. You can use a um, team builder activity. So like Teampedia has some really great um, team builders that students can do to focus on how to communicate and collaborate effectively or problem solve. Um, so these are all pieces in that, and then there's like videos that kind of help explain that as well. And I go back to the table of contents. Whoops, here we go. Click that in the headers, the links are there. So these are all modules. So digital citizenship, how we build culture. Um, you know, if we want to teach collaboration, the skills of collaboration, we can, there's resources there. So each of these modules deal with different components that you might want to do with them. Or you, you, I don't see you using all of these as a, as a, for a club or a, or a team coach. I see you might using the first two. And then the one say content production, there's two content productions that you might look at or even team strategies. But also in the appendices, which is this section at the bottom has additional resources. So if I'm looking at culture building resources, what are they? Well, there you go. There's steps for creating norms. Um, one of the things, one of the other strategies that I mentioned, I was going to go into the last one. It's called talk moves. Okay, and talk moves provides different prompts when you want stu your students or your players to have conversation with each other. So, you know, if I'm trying to, if, if I try to explain, or Daniel's trying to explain to me how to get out of iron. Um, and he's like, you know, if you just use your map, um, you know, my response, if I don't agree with them, I don't want to say, no, that's not true or you're wrong because that's not a good conversation. Instead, I might say, I, this problem, I disagree and why it would be, you know, I agree with you that the map is, more, is useful, but, you know, there's these prompts or I respectfully disagree with your idea about the map. 
And I think because blah, 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 blah. So we're actually giving them prompts to help them work through. So you don't have to, they don't have to adhere to the problem. It's more of they have as a reference. And then if they, if they ask or make a statement that is that you construe as problematic, you say, hey, John, you know, you said you disagree with them, but why don't you, could you restate that again using one of these prompts? And I go back and do that. And it makes me pause and think, oh, I guess when I said you're an idiot, that was not a good way to have a conversation. So these are different strategies. Oh, I just realized all this time I'm talking about talk moves. You couldn't see it because my shared screen was now in the same thing. You're all being so polite and not saying a word about it. So let me show it to you. Here it is. Um, this is something that came out of work uh, in schools working in science, but I've seen it in use in all different disciplines. Uh, but it's a great piece for your players when they're doing um, re bot reviews or looking, you know, doing um, an assessment of, you know, what's the best strategy, their best approach. And again, you don't have to know the game to teach this because you can listen to what they're saying. It's not what they're saying, it's how they're saying it and some of their word choice. And this is where you say, hey, you know, I have, when you talk about jungle, I have jungle pathing, I have no clue what you mean by that, jungle pathing. What is this, is that a movie or something? Don't tell me. What I do know is, you know, rather than saying, you know, this, I want you to pick one of these prompts and restate it using this, because this is much more professional language. And there's just a variety of different topics. So you have this resource, uh, in your, this was the, the right here it says talk moves. It's right there. So you can go directly to that in the agenda. Um, and then again, you also have it, <clears throat> excuse me, let me go and new share again. You also have it in this document right here. And what's great about the appendices is there's just all this resources that you can, you can pull from based upon what you want to do. So there's things like think before you speak. This is great for, for digital citizenship, you know, and great for players. You know, first of all, players shouldn't be typing in the chat because if they're typing in the chat, then they're not playing the game. Um, but even if you're, if you're not using chat and you're just talking, it's like, you know, think before you say something. If I'm really angry about a player, angry at myself, is it true? Is it Hopeful? Is it inspiring? If they think no for any one of those, then don't say it. You know, move on. Um, so you got these different strategies. So you got the talk moves is right there. Um, feedback protocols. There's this additional protocols here that they can incorporate, uh, and and you get all the tools right here that you can utilize with your your, your players. And what's great about this, you can utilize with your you know in your classrooms. So this is about dealing teaching global professional skills like communication and collaboration. There's different resources that are available to you to, to actually do that work. Um, you know, and, and you explain how to set it up so that you can do that. And so here's an example. If we want students to be effective communicators, what does communication look and sound like? So like, I listen to others. I make eye contact. Because like, what does listening mean? Well, listening means I make eye contact. I nod when I understand or agree. I give my full attention. I'm not looking at something else. Um, you know, I clearly share my ideas. So clearly share ideas. I think about the pitch of my voice so that I don't sound like this when I'm trying to talk to you about something. You know, it, it's making it concrete. And so students become self-aware. And then if they're self-aware, when you hear a conversation going on, it doesn't sound very good or positive. You don't have to explain it to them. You point to the communication chart and say, John, I want you to look at that. And I want you, based upon how, uh, you know, how Tina was talking, what is the area of communication that you feel like could be better, done better? And, you know, it might be pitch. It might be, um, you know, whatever it is. I just, I, I, I point it out. And what thing is when I point out because it's concrete, Tina can look at that. It's like, well, that's not, I respectfully disagree because I was doing blah, 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 blah. So there could be an actually productive conversation because the language in these charts is concrete and observable. We can see it or we don't see it. 
both if we feel that someone else is not doing it or if we're told we're not doing it, we can look at and either agree or say, well, no, I respectfully disagree. So there's all these different tools and resources that you can incorporate, you know, review and incorporate into your team, your club. Like if you're doing engineering design process, this is the whole um, uh, guide to think about how this would look like. Um, and you, you can do this, like if students are trying to engineer the best champion builds, you know, this is something that they can incorporate. So this is all in here. Um, it's part of this, this resource guide that you have access to. And you're gonna get time to explore this, to see what you might incorporate into, for your team. Okay. So I think, did I, did I answer that question? I think was it Tina, was it you who asked about, you know, are there places where these resources are available to just take and use? Yeah, you gave, oh, uh, yeah, you gave um, a good explanation and a lot of resources. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure. And I know there's a lot there and that's why in, in just a little bit, I'm going to be giving you guys some time to explore it because Part of like this Coaches Institute is real, in part is to give you time to explore new materials and think about how you can structure within um, your coaching plan. Uh, and rather than otherwise, if we just, if I just talk through the whole thing, it would feel overwhelming. Like, okay, I, I don't have time to digest this. Um, any of our experienced people, and I say experience, if you've, if you've coached a sport, I know one of you coached soccer, um, or, you know, Daniel, I know you, you, you've done a pilot, so you've got some experience there. Um, can, you, can any of you share what, um, how might, either how might some of these things be helpful in facilitating player conversations, or what are some things you've done that's not here that you find has been helpful to facilitate player conversations? I think it's definitely helpful to create a lot more of a professional atmosphere because um, especially with my club that it was mainly just casual friendly but still had that competitive side to it due to the fact that they mostly played competitive games against each other. Uh, it's very easy for them to fall into that, oh, these are my friends, these are my guys, I can be a little bit more rowdy with them. Uh, and not be as professional with them, but stuff like this and creating these uh, or giving them these resources and these ways of structure and critique um, will help bridge from, okay, yeah, these are my friends, these are my guys, but what I'm doing now with them is professional, is trying to get better and creating a more um, professional atmosphere within uh, the esports program rather than it just being a fun club. That's at least what I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I appreciate you emphasizing the distinction between a club and a team um, because, again, there are players who are high level players. When they come into a team, they think, oh, this is, this is going to be the same casual approach, but we don't. We don't do that in a soccer team. We don't do that in a basketball team. We don't say, hey, just show up. We're just going to hang out. No, it's professional. It's a combination of class and work, and we, we want to put out the best product. So we got to be streamlined and focused, and there's a way to do this, and it's the way that's been designed by your coach. Whereas a club, I mean, you're going to still – you're going to work in some of these professional practices, but there's space for people to just kind of relax. As long as they're relaxed, but are, I'm sorry, as long as they're positive and supportive of each other and welcoming of each other, then they can be relaxed. They can't just say, oh, it's just trying to be funny. No. Saying you suck and you should just quit the game and never play it again is not. That's your idea of being funny and core. So let's look at our gamer code of conduct and let's talk about that. Let's look at our gamer norms that we established where it says respect each other. How is saying that respectful? Well, it wasn't. Hmm, okay. So those are pieces there. Um, who, was our, who was the soccer coach? 
I'm going to be um, one of the soccer coaches at Lake Worth. Okay, so I don't yeah, know if anybody else is a soccer coach. I'd like to know who else. <laughs> Before I put Nellie on the spot, was there any other anyone else a soccer coach or a coach of other sports, traditional sports? Nellie, have you coached before? No, I just participated um, very little last year on the track team. And and um, I initially went out to, to kind of participate in the soccer team, mainly because I have a computer science club and I wanted to um, recruit um, girls for my Girls Who Code club. <laughs> so that's where this whole thing came about and I was like wow and so I participated more so in the track team like just helping the the coach out um but I also spoke with the soccer team and they approached me for next year so let's see how that goes um I mean I've seen how it all works she kind of showed me um a little bit of what they do. And since I was out there, you know, several days a week, I would see um, everything that they were doing on the soccer team. Absolutely. And I think your experience with track is, is, is a crossover as well. Like I said, I was a track coach for girls, uh, girls track um, varsity. And, you know, the conversation, there's a lot of feedback that happens in track and it, it being, you know, how we do that and how we have, our team members, like for example, I would coach the distance group. So, I mean, there's a lot of joint conversations that happen about form and setup and strategy that, that goes on. There's a lot of mechanics that we think, especially mechanics, whether it's distance, sprinters, or um, field. Um, those, those, there's, there's, there's different things that we, we look at in that regards. And Jaka, have you, have you, I, you said that your boys want you to coach the soccer team. Have you coached before? Oh, there was some space there. So there's, um, yeah. So the point about this is these, this are very much applicable in a lot of different places and how you establish the, the conversations uh, it will empower your students to, your players and your student staff to have agency to be a partner with you in this work. Because the more they're a partner, the more buy-in they have to the, into the process. Okay, so here is what we are going to do. Let's kind of double check this for a moment. Um, I wanna give you uh, some time to look at these resources based on what appeals to you. So it might be looking at these strategies and these and seeing what you might want to incorporate in both, let's be quite honest, for your team. And maybe you might even want to test it in your classroom. And also take a look at this resource. This is the PDF that you get to download and have uh, for as a reference, which will work for, te for teams and will work for clubs as well when we talk about clubs in, next, uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, no, it's next week. That's right. Uh, anyway, you'll know, take a look at the resources. Uh, I'm going to create, again, I'm going to create uh, breakout rooms, and they're optional to join. You can stay in the main room, uh, and then you're going to have 30 minutes to explore these resources and think about how they fit into your emerging plan as a coach for a team. Again, if you're not thinking to start a team this year, maybe you can start a club. You can think of it from that perspective as well, but just take some time and think about what would be important for culture. This is all about establishing a positive, welcoming, and professional culture that empowers your students to be a part of that experience. And if you need to talk to me, just come back to this main space and I will be here to answer any questions. We're going to come back together at um, one. Um, 145. Okay, actually we'll say 150, 150, make it equal. I will see you then.
looking at what is one strategy, at least one strategy that you are using, or are looking to use in planning. Wow, uh, talk moves. That, that's a real good strategy. Hear from everybody else. I lost my chat. I don't know what I did with it. Sorry, I have my screen minimized. Um, I the one that I was looking at is just the, the page. I think it's page sixty. But it talks about strategy. Page, page sixty in the outline guide. We go over there. Page 60. Oh, team strategies and tactics, that module. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that to me, um, that should be key so that they all go, they all know what the expectations are and they can do like what you guys were talking about or what um, Mr. Gilbert mentioned about, you know, um, being, being able to role play. You know, and and to really understand what what it takes to to play um, in a team. Yeah, no, definitely, great point. That's so. There's one thing she's referring to this right here. Hey, let's either hear from other other anyone else, or just you can use the chat to post. Lots of good stuff in here. All right. Well, how we're returning to that when they uh, when they're ready. So the next thing, the last thing on our on our focus for today has to do with practice structures. You know, we talked about that piece is something that's important to establish. And you know some of that is going to be affected by how, how frequent you can meet, uh, as well as the length of time. And so, if you kind of look at this checklist, if you click this link, it'll take you to the practice checklist. And so, there's two parts. The key part is the list on the first page, which, by the way, because this is a Google Doc, you can just click make a copy and you have your own copy. Um, but these are the things to consider. We put this in the agenda as well. And then the second page, let me just make this a little bit bigger, is um, has to do with a sample of what a practice schedule might look like. So as we bring this up here, let me make the screen bigger, bring it up on the glance. Uh, yeah, and again, this is based upon a two-hour practice. Again, if you only have an hour or maybe you only have 30 minutes, then yours is not going to look like this uh, in terms of like yours 30 minutes. But you, you, what you want to do is think about um, how you, what, what are the things that are most important? And then how do you rotate in the other components as well? Uh, so you can see like in this particular practice, there's a warm-up and stretching. You know, which is really important for wrist and um, uh, core. I mean, you have a body, like when we're sitting in the chair, you know, part of the, um, potentially part of the challenges could be is a weak core. Uh, so, you know, doing uh, things around the core with stretching, which might be, uh, might be plank pose, might be, you know, something else where they're, they're engaging their core as they're doing the activity to, to work on that core strength. Mindfulness talk or meditation practices are really valuable. Well, put everyone in the right state of mind because everyone we know with esports, it, there, it requires a lot of focus and paying attention to detail. 
Uh, and if you know what students or players are coming in and they're bringing in the baggage or they're bringing in the day that they've gone through and they're thinking about that, we need them to you know, kind of clear their minds. And so it's just a suggested thing, you know, like how can we do something to get them focused? Maybe it's a story, maybe it's an icebreaker or, some, or a talk around something that has to do with game related. Uh, you know, it's an opportunity there to review the gamer code of conduct. Um, or share strategy, like one really valuable piece we think about students who are players who start to lose focus and get upset with themselves is what's a way of talking oneself out of being uh, negative or self-destructive. Uh, one way is, you know, this, this is going to sound strange, but you know how, if, I'm sure you all listen to a traditional sports athlete or some some celebrity talk refer themselves in the third person. You know, uh, you know they, they just say, well, John thinks blah, 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 and John thinks that. And you're like, what the heck is this person doing? Like, they're right there. Why are they talking to third person? But well, here's how it could be useful as a player. And, and those of you who play games, and if you aren't, aren't playing games, try it out sometime. Let's play a game, and then next time you are in a situation where um, – it's getting stressful. Maybe you're having a bad moment. I mean, you're just not playing well in a certain part. Is coach yourself and talk, refer to yourself not as I need to do this, but talk to yourself as in third person. So, like, for example, um, the other night I was playing a rank game and we did it early in the day and it was, it was completely destructive. Like, I died, someone else died. I'm like, great, okay, it's a jungler, I just invaded, and now I, I died, but now the other jungler is ahead of me. Uh, and and sure enough, they also went to my other, to my, I was in blue side, they went to my other top lane and they took my red buff, which you don't have to know what that is, just know that it was miserable to see that. And so at that point, it's like, I had no place to go. And so rather than getting frustrated about it, I was like, all right, John, let's think about what can you do? Can you look at your lane? All right, John, look at your lanes and see what is available to go help and support. Um, you know, and otherwise, you know, maybe this is a good time to just go back and get something. And then just by the time you come back again, your camps will be up. So, John, why don't you just, just make that move? Just talking to yourself that way in the third person, you're actually coaching yourself. And, it's, and it puts some distance. So it takes away the emotion. It leaches out that, any frustration that's happening. So you might do that as part of like that five minute piece about mindfulness talks. I mean, that could be the piece you do. And just for those who, who play, who coach traditional sports, or if you play traditional sports, you know that there's always practice of skills. But in games, we call that the mechanics. And so how do you approach mechanics practice? And, you know, that would be one phase of your, of your practice uh, that you would put together or you do that with the help or guidance or support of your students. Um, who would be who be doing that? And you'll see facilitated by section. So it's the coach if you feel knowledgeable about it. Otherwise, it could be the team captain, or one of the team captain. Just know that your team captain should not be necessarily the best player, but rather the best facilitator on your team um, who could who could do that. Um, and then you have team practice. So there's mechanics, which is usually individual, individual or paired. And then there's team where you're doing team level dynamics, where you might be doing, this is like when you start doing scrims, the whole team, or doing some airing on the work on group um, pieces, or if you're doing uh, Rocket League, you know, doing scrims three on three, two v twos, things like that, just to work on those skills and, um, and plays that you want to incorporate, set up scenarios, um, situations that they can, you know, try as best you can. You know, you see VOD reviews is, is um, in pairs individual. It says PBD uh, because sometimes you're not going to do that in a given day. Maybe it's just looking as a whole team or giving us homework. And then always close with some type of reflection on the day, on their practice and what they did. So you come back to culture. Start with culture. You end with culture. And, you, you, and while you're doing that, you can do warm-ups and stretches or warm, or really warm downs. This should be warm downs, right? Not warm ups. So let's put that warm downs and stretching, right? 
So we look at this or just looking at this because this is the list right here. When you look at this, what observations do you have? Like how could this be helpful? Or yeah, this looks good, but here's a challenge I see. Yeah, cool down, that's a good point. Let's, let's, let's fix that. That just makes more sense, cool down. So what are, what are some things here that you think will be helpful when putting together practice or you see as a, maybe there's an obstacle. Helpful establish routine, yes. Yes, absolutely. And then players just know what to expect. Play student staff, you will know where, where their role is. Remember, you can have a player who is not, uh, who doesn't make the team because they just aren't one, they're not that high level of a skilled player, but they might be knowledgeable of the role or of the game and they can help with, with the track, the practice. What else? Okay. Then what we're going to do is um, I'm going to put, put you into groups. Or again, I'll let you pick the go. Oh, how do we? How do you select who makes the team? Um, let's see. We'll come back to just a moment. It'll also, be good to have different meetings based around different things like Mondays are bot reviews, Wednesdays are tech. Yeah, excellent point, Daniel. Just you know, you, uh, you know, you can set some of those particular pieces. Like, like, do we need to do bot reviews every day? No. It kind of depends on where your needs are. There might be a specific day where you put more time into that um, and what your focus might be in, in that regard. So, and tactics can be the same thing. Absolutely. So let's go back, back uh, to Tina's question. How do you select who makes the team? So those of you, who, well, um, so that is something, let's go back to the coaches checklist. This one, you know, tryout process. So I'm gonna start this, and then Daniel and anyone else that has done tryouts, uh, did tryouts, you didn't do tryouts. Okay, didn't have to. Oh, lucky. Um, so first of all, let's just say that if you have a lot of kids who want to try out, so let's say you're doing Rocket League, which is three slots. And I just realized something. Is my recording? Yes. Okay. Um, so let's just usually there's just three slots for a rock for a rocket league team. Uh, you probably want at least nine to ten players on that team because you have someone who dropped out, who are who, who still becomes academically knowledgeable, and then you got to slot someone else in, as well as you want at least three on three so you can do full scrim practices. Now you go larger and, and have like, like you maybe have 15, you say, I wanna take 15 kids. I wanna take 20, I got 21 kids trying out. I'm gonna keep them all and just have them do a lot of scrimming because they get to play, they get to do scrimming, which helps everyone get better. And now I got a larger pool of players who if we play A team and B team and C team, if another school has additional players, then they, they can get them um, uh, reps, which may not, won't count to the school record, but they at least get to compete against other teams. So you could do that, and that would be great. Ultimately, though, you still got to pick who are the starters. And you still want to look at a few other things for anyone who's going to come on the team. So you'll see in this list, it says a lot of these games have solo queue and ranking. So you would want part you create some type of form that students would fill out and turn in. And one of the things you want is what is uh, the account name uh, of their main account? And their main account has to be one that is has a solo queue. It, now, maybe they've never done solo queues, so then just what's their main account? Because when you have the main account, you can look up the history 
in most cases, depending upon what the game is. And you kind of see for yourself, you know, what they play, how they do. Um, and th that could be information about, you know, if, if they are highly skilled or just, just you know, um, average, which, which is fine, because you still might, that's not going to be the side factor, but it is a factor. Uh, you want to look at digital footprint, you know, so as much as you can find out about who they are. So sometimes what some schools do is they require students to get a, uh, a reference from an adult. Um, I, I, that's an iffy thing because sometimes the kids you, you want to reach and get the opportunity, it might be kids who may not fit what we consider a good behave student. And this might be their opportunity to learn how to do that. Um, but, you know, if you can find a little bit about, you know, about their personality in terms of playing with others, which you can find in the tryouts, you just watch how they play or, you know, or give, do a team build at the very beginning where the, everyone's out of their element before you can get into the game and then see how they interact with each other. That can give you some ideas. Are they academically eligible? You know, because if they're not academically eligible, like how do you determine eligibility? My rec my suggestion is to follow whatever the guidelines are for uh, traditional sports, for your, your students and traditional athletes. What's, what's the expectation for academic eligibility? And then use, use that so you don't have to reinvent the wheel on that. Um, you know, find out, do they have any conflicts with other school commitments? Again, this is not going to decide by itself, but if someone's like, well, you know, I want to do this, but I'm also in band or I also play tennis. Well, you got a choice. Either you try to work with the other adult teacher or educator um, and see if there's some type of compromise so that the student can do both, um, or the student's going to have to choose you know, which way they want to go. So it, it's something that you want to consider because you might say, hmm, this student's saying they want to be on a team, but they're really committed to band, and that means they're going to miss you know, most practices. They might get to one practice a week. And I got this other student who's just slightly behind them in skill, but they can be here every day and they're equally as coachable. I might go with the less skilled person because they're going to be there every day. So they're likely going to surpass the other student. It kind of depends on the situation. And then, um, you know, you want to do some type of contract. This is in addition to the player code of conduct or the gamer code of conduct, um, because it's essentially you, you get the student to agree that they're going to commit the time. They're going to show up to practice. They're going to show up to the game based upon your uh, routine and when you want them to show up. This is a professional, this is like, this is their job besides school being their job. And so you they, they need to show responsibility and, and what the parents assign, parent or guardian, so that they're aware of those expectations. So when you look at this, what are some expectations here for trials that you think, hmm, I don't know if that is something to do? Or what's, what do you think is missing? What should be added to this list? And this is usually like before they even actually play, so you can try watch watch them. Um, oh, we have here. Be good to have different meetings based around different times, like Mondays are, oh, we did that, right? Sorry, I thought it was something new. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, it's true. If, if they let other people play their account, um, which hopefully, you know, that, that's going to be a rarity. Um, once they scrim, it's going to be, the rankings just kind of give you an idea. We're not going to just pick them based on that. We still want them to play because remember the example I gave you about the college student who was really good and the coach was like, at the end of the season, we're never, I'm, I'm kicking this kid off the team because they, they, you know, they were toxic. You might have a, a, a you know, when you want them to play. So if they play and it's like, oh my gosh, this is a high diamond player, which is considered a, a very skilled player. And yet, they don't seem to play, they're getting outplayed by my newbie or they're getting outplayed by my bronze player. What's going on here? There, there's, there's something off. And if, if it's either having a bad day or it's you, if you find out that someone else is playing their account and they didn't tell you that, well, then that's an honest, honesty situation. You got to decide if you want them on the team or not. 
Um, maybe you keep them on the team because it's a lesson learned, give them a chance, or maybe, maybe you don't. Um, so some of that is observations, but good, good question or a good point. What else? What are some other, you know, even if you've not coached, you've been, you know, you can think about through like the logistics and the logic of what are things you'd want to know. Um, and again, you meet with, you know, get together with a student who is knowledgeable in the game, if you're not knowledgeable, and they can help you form, create the trial besides this information where they, we have the students actually play and see how they do. You know, you might include like one or two students who um, you might have um, on staff or who might end up being on the team and they're gonna help you the first time, help you rate the rest of the players. Yeah, I was thinking about that and I was, um, I don't know, I was just thinking about that maybe it would be good to um, have more of an extended tryout um, period where they have to pass, you know, aside from the things that you um, just mentioned, I wrote them all down just to keep them in mind and when I'm um, preparing the, the contract. But aside from that, I want to know if um, they know how to play, right? And everybody wants to know that. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and so I was thinking making that say like you do a, a semester, because obviously you need more time because there's maybe some kids that um, never played that specific game, but they are really good, you know, gamers. So they need some time to really master um, the game. So have a period where, okay, these are this is tryout time. We're gonna be trying out for this first quarter or half the quarter, whatever you wanna call it. And then from that group of kids, we're gonna um, pull out who will be part of the team. And then so that the other kids don't feel bad because you know, they all, it's the whole equity thing. You wanna make sure that everybody is included, even those kids that are a little bit um, behind, just let them be part of the club, but not necessarily the team. This way they have something to look forward to maybe and open it up next um, you know, semester. You know what I mean? That way they can have you know, something to look at Something to look forward to and really work towards that. Yeah, I mean, they definitely be part of the club and, and have them be part of the team staff. You know, yeah, where that's a, that's a good idea too. Yeah. So that now they're helping a team. If they're helping a team, they get to listen in to the practice conversations. They might get a chance to see some of the scrims and learn through that those observations. And mm -hmm. if for some reason you know, you don't have a whole lot of players on the team, you know, maybe academic, a lot, if a lot of players become academically eligible, who knows, hey, student staff person, we might need to suit you up <laughs> and play. Um, that's not likely to happen that piece, but at least they, they get to be a part of it. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see, there is, there is some, I saw some pieces in the chat. Um, how do you find teams compete against that are also sanctioned by the district? Uh, that is something that uh, it's going to be in part based upon the platform, which I, John might want to speak to that. Yeah, John, you go ahead. And speak to that. Yeah, no, I was going to say, uh, you know, first of all, it's, you know, you can find other schools on Twitter or social media uh, and just connect with them. I mentioned earlier as well in the district, once I have the coach list, um, I'll be making like a Google space where you can chat with one another and, um, and say, Hey, does anyone want to play rocket league next week? I've got, you know, three kids or whatever. Um, and then the last option, uh, like Angelica said, there are leagues. So, um, NACEF, which is one of the leagues that we will talk about when we get to that point, I'm sure. Um, they actually have like a script, it's almost like a scrim finder. So you go into your profile once you've registered your school and you could say, I want Smash Brothers on these days of the week. And it'll show what other schools that are in the uh, in that league that want to also play that day. And then the leagues, if you're actually part of a league, will have set days and times for uh, for when you want when you'll be matched up with whatever school. You got a combination of, of you can set up a, a schedule for competing against schools inside a district, which you all have locus control with through 
the structures John just described, as well as there are leaks out there. And, and part of it is platform-based um, where you can hear, like use NACEF to create those connections and establish your, your, your schedule. Or if you're part of a platform, uh, I can't remember, John, what's the name of the platform you, you, that, that was used by a team that, that went to nationals? That was EGF, Electronic Gaming Federation. Yeah, um, so groups like that have, they, they will establish a schedule um, for competition. Um, there are fees connected to those, uh, but, and, and that's something, I'm sure that's part of the, the conversation that district guitars where that will evolve. Yeah, so like NASAP is free. They'll yeah. they'll have a couple of games. Last year they were working with HSEL, so you know you actually would be playing on HSEL's platform for the whatever two games that were free. Um, also, there's something called the Sunshine State Esports League, which is um, it's the Florida NASAP affiliate that they are trying to get up and running. They started last year, and so basically that's that's going to be like all the schools in Florida that want to compete with one another. They're going to run tournaments through the Sunshine State Esports League. And then there was something we were working on. It, it never came to, plot, to pass, but it may come up, which was a tri-county league between us, Broward, and Dade, where we could just compete in the Southeast Florida as well. Um, so there are lots of ways to find other people to play against. And I think, you know, now that we're expanding district wide, you're going to have a lot, you're going to have lots of opportunities to just play against one another as well. Um, you know, you might partner off, meet one of a fellow coach and you guys are become good friends and work it out. And, you know, you have biweekly competitions between your two schools. We had one of the pilot schools that actually drive their kids down to the other pilot school and have an in-person smash tournament. Um, so yeah, so there's lots of opportunities that, you know, there's just nothing official at the district level yet. We're not there yet. But coming soon. <laughs> um, all right. Any other questions or oh, we see, um, what about using Slack channels? That was a question that was asked, I guess, going back to Discord, um, is Slack an option? Um, I don't really know. I don't know. I, I don't see Slack as an option either. Um, they're going to give you the same excuse as Discord. So I would be using Discord, you know, just on students' personal devices. Or is the Slack channel talking about connecting us together? And, um, you know, that's really just going to be that Google space because that's kind of our main, you know, communication platform in the districts. It's just easier to create a Google space because it's all right in our email for that. And one of the things that I think like the the tools that Discord offers for free, Slack, if they have it, you have to pay the fee version yeah. for that. And in Discord, there are since since the district is, is allowing for the staff, the adult staff to have access to Discord, there are different network groups on Discord for esports that will make it easy for you to join. And not only build networks, but also that's another way to find other schools to compete against. You can also build or create your own um, di Discord account. And that way it's only yeah. for your specific yeah. um, groups and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can create a Discord. And um, so one of the, I believe Jupiter High is the one that's created their own Discord with their kids and all that stuff. They've got all kinds of bots in there and they really tricked it all out. I, I struggle with Discord, so I'm not 100% on there yet. Uh, I, I play in there once in a while, but there's just so much information. It's overwhelming for me, so. No, I know. Um, I, my, my son, um, he's 13, and he yeah. has been on Discord for uh, several um, years now. So yeah. but what's really crazy, yeah. I mean, and he's, he's only 13, so you could imagine, but Oh, yeah, I, I know. It's definitely their mode of communication now. It's definitely. No, no, the, I know, but I definitely know what you're talking about yeah. as far as sometimes there's way too much information and sometimes some really crazy things pop up because I'm constantly monitoring yeah. what he's yeah. doing. And I'm like, I look at my son and I'm like, how did that get through? 
Yeah. Don't worry, mom. Um, they're gonna ban it. They're gonna ban it. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah. It doesn't matter. They've already posted it. You've already seen it. It's already in your brain. <laughs> yeah. No. I and I agree, especially middle schoolers. It, it's it. I would not use middle. I would not be using Discord in middle school. Um, you know, you can use a Google Classroom to communicate with your group. Just create an extra Google Classroom. Most of the high schools in the pilot were just using Google Classroom to communicate. And the teacher or the co or the student coach was the one using Discord, not the whole team. So yeah, so there are definitely ways to communicate beyond Discord. I mean, our groups are going to be—they're not going to be huge, small enough that we can communicate using. Um, I just thought it would be fun to have something like, and there might be other things that are out there that we can use um, to do communication that's more. Um, private instead of it being so open the way discord is yeah and i've been i've been trying to work with uh NASEF. they're they're pushing discord they're working with discord to get them to understand the importance of either an edu version or some sort of lockdown version for education um you know obviously it's a huge company so they're you know evaluating what their best steps are but yeah there have been negotiations with them the thing with Discord is that you can create a private Discord, so it, it it's secure in that sense that, and students can't share codes because you can you can set up codes that are that expire or are temporary. Yeah. Uh, there's also you know now this gets a little bit more in depth, but you can have you can have students who can look at bots that will moderate like looking for language, or you could have student staff whose job is to. Um, moderate the conversation. It doesn't mean that the students have to address issues, but if they see issues in language choice or, or, or you know, toxicity, then they can report that to the adult. And then that way, then the adult follows through on that. So, I mean, it's, if, if we're trying to teach students how to behave appropriately in, in such an environment, then it's not, this is an opportunity to do that and give students not the job to quote police, what's happening but rather to monitor um so that coaching can, conversations can happen and of course if a student struggles repeatedly then it might become a disciplinary question um, but they do use discord a lot of the esports community um, uses discord so to um you can step away from that it just creates a disadvantage for your kids um, and we think about college and career opportunities and for networking. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I really, um, I'm on the fence um, with it a little bit, but at the same time, you know, I've watched my son and seen some of the things that, mm -hmm. you know, some of the benefits that came out of it by him doing this, because as you said, you know, you can create bots and do all these things. And he's one of the ki these kids that's a stickler for, you know, um, fairness and all of this stuff. And he just like, you know, he joins these, these things to become part of their staff and all this crazy stuff. And I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm creating a bot for this and this to do this and do that. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So I let him go with it, you know, cause I know he's, and I can hear his conversations, even though he's got his head, I just gave him his, a headset when he turned basically 13, because I wanted to hear everything that was going on. So I had on full blast speaker mode because I want to know what's going on with it. But sometimes you got to trust them, you know, and I do. And he knows, you know, what I don't approve of. And hopefully that, um, you know, what we teach our kids, you know, it sticks to their in their minds, you know what I mean? But Having an environment like that, open like that, um, we I think that it should be like what we'll have. What's the that's the organization that NASEF, What they're doing is really good and 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 uh, collaborating and trying to make that edu version. That way, we make sure that none of those things pop up and in their screen. You know, you can't put a pop up blocker, but I guess the version of pop up blockers is uh, bot blockers or whatever you want to call it or bots. <laughs> Notice and it's so to help me because whenever I'm in um, Discord, I've never seen ad pop ups. Is, is that is that something are you referring to? Ad? No, it wasn't an ad. Somebody um, posted like a really vulgar or yeah, almost immoral, whatever you want to call it, 
disgusting mm-hmm. gif. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. And it was very <laughs> explicit, put it that way. And I was like, and then it immediately went away or whatever. I don't know if the bot got rid of it or whatever the case may be. But the point is, is that it was out there for that one split second. And I saw it just walking by his room. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, that's just totally wrong. And I'm, I'm talking to him because I have these conversations with him, you know, and I'm like, what is that? And he's like, oh, don't worry, mom. They're, they blocked it already. I'm like, it doesn't matter. It already went in your brain. Yeah. And so, and that's the key thing about what you, you're having the conversations with your son around that. And so when you have, if um, it's part of a team, you have a, um, a discord channel for your team or for your club. Uh, I'm not saying you have to, but if you do, and let's say that happens, this is in your, re- in your realm, you're going to know who did it. And then that's, that's a, depending upon what this, this, the issue of severity or the intention, you know, that's either a, a coaching conversation or that person might be suspended or banned from Discord. Suspended means you're off for a while, you got to think about this and, you know, and you know, we'll give you another shot in a week or two or a month um, uh, or a, a a ban is you're off. You 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 didn't you, you did something that was blatantly against our code of conduct, the contract you signed, and you, you chose to do this anyway. Um, the thing I, I try to be, I hesitate about permanent bans because especially middle schoolers, but also too with high schoolers, sometimes their brain chemistry, you know, just they will do things that yes are inappropriate, and yes they should know better, but sometimes they do something and it's a coaching, it's an opportunity for coaching conversation. But you have, the ultimate thing is you have complete control of your, your channel and, and you, you both in terms of how you set it up as well as how you want to manage and monitor it. I'm definitely, if, if I set something up like that, um, and, you know, given that the district gives us permission to do so, I'm going to have, because my son's been doing this for so much longer than me, I'm going to have him help me set up all those Absolutely. and everything. Absolutely. And, and then I'm going to have him, uh, I'm going to make him um, create videos of when he's doing it so that I can <laughs> use it and show the kids how to do it, you know, and have somebody else in my classroom, you know, make sure that those bots are always up and running. <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely. I was even going to say, for a brief while, I even have and technically still have a Discord for my esports club that's still very much under works and making sure everything's together. But one thing uh, that I recommend you do, just uh, period, is either uh, don't make a public invite, have the students have to personally come to you to sign up for it, or what. Uh, I did to set up in mind was if you join uh, the Discord, you can have a uh, a role that just gets assigned to people uh, to any account that joins that doesn't let them do anything. You can't do a single thing until uh, me as the teacher. I come around, I see you, and I get your name, student number, everything. You confirm with me. You sign up with me okay, you are a student at the school. I have all your information. I know this is your Discord account. That way students know, hey, you are held accountable for anything that you post. Uh, And then from there, more student moderation, just keep up with it more daily though. Um, Well, I I guess you can say lucky that my Discord, since we weren't doing much competing and we were a lot more casual of a a club, it ended up, you know, dying out, not being as popular of a choice for students to use, definitely suffered a bit, a bit from trying to make things too big at the start. Um, But um, whatchamacallit, there were still some students that were posting some stuff that was fringe, like just kind of weird, like not necessarily immediate, (laughs) immediately like bannable kick offense, but it's just like, why? Are you posting that GIF out of nowhere of uh, just something random? Uh, so definitely something you want to look at and monitor. And you can even, uh, if need be, 
said it so no one can post media period so it's just discussion it's just for channels to talk in channels to talk uh text about video games in but they can't post pictures they can't post gifs uh and all that sort of stuff so you can through discord's own uh settings limit what they can do to make sure that they do not share that sort of stuff yeah and i like i like what you're saying and it kind of reminds me too i mean in my watching um the things with my son he actually um participates in things where they do have those role bases and and based on um how you do in this in the games and stuff you can apply for specific roles and everything so it teaches them how to apply for a job he he he's done so many different things i'm like look at him what are you doing now oh, i'm applying for this job for this this that and the other and i'm like oh my god they're teach so they're learning even uh, things about work in this whole gaming environment which is pretty cool you know, so I just let them be, but, you know, I, I do like your idea and, and it just brings to mind that having that, having Discord and putting all those specific, uh, what do you want to call them, rules or triggers or whatever you want to call them in place so that none of those things happen, but making it an environment where it's fun and, and we could even add that reward system that we were talking about before with those roles that the kids get throughout um, using it. So right there is, is uh, John, a selling point for you for, uh, for, these, for the TCC or whoever those people are. I just, <laughs> the Mr. Knows over there. That's how we look at them, sorry. <laughs> I know one thing I wanted, uh, I wanted to do is not only was I posting when we made our little brackets for when we did our, um, in-person tournaments and um, in-person competitions just within the club. Um, one thing I wanted to do was to make a, a role that gets tied to your purse, uh, that gets tied to the, their account specifically for students who have won a tournament uh, just to give them that reward of here's the badge to say official, I was number one, I still am number one look at the badge, pay some respect. Uh, <laughs> something fun for them. I wonder if they have, um, you know how they have badges for certifications and stuff? I wonder if they have badges for gamers. They should if they don't. <laughs> they have roles and you can do fun commands in Discord, but I would never release Discord to middle school and high schoolers. And not that we're, we're talking, I mean, I wouldn't either, but if you were to do it in a closed environment, that may be something. Um, yeah, but you can't close off the DMs that they're going to send. And I've seen the middle schoolers' discords already on their phone, and they're absolutely disgusting and all the things they pull out of them. Yeah, it's not so much that, you know, you're, they're in your private Discord channel, which is fine. It's more that they can get into other, you know, they can join other discords that are inappropriate and you have literally no control over it. You can lock yours down, but they can just find inappropriate discords and join those and be in there instead of in yours, you know, working. So that's the bigger, I think, concern. Not so much that, you know, it's your own locked environment. It's more, I can also join any channel over here I want to join and it could be bad. But what's going to, the reality is, is that they're doing that already in um, school without right. even being in a, a program. You so, know I mean? and but so, if we're introducing it, we get blamed for it as the teacher. So yeah, I'm well, not and, getting blamed and I know, for that. You know, I, I don't know many of you in here. I've been at the district for about 12 years now at the district level. Uh, I'm kind of anti uh, district level stuff. I'm the one that advocates for teachers and gets them to understand and uh you'll be surprised how far we have come with this at least uh allowing certain things um and, and you know just the things i've had to navigate over the past two years of just to get a permission slip for a year and a half but it took a year and a half to get the permission slip but what i've done is circumvented other district roadblocks that would have taken forever to get approval through 
So like, for example, if you want to play Rocket League, you've got to have an account with Epic Games. Well, that means that Epic Games and Rocket League have to go through our legal department. They have to talk to the lawyers on both sides. Rocket League is not going to change anything. Epic's not going to change anything. And then we don't get to play. But because the permission slip allows you to write, the parents are agreeing that you can create accounts. So basically now every game is open without having for it to go through all the district level policies. So, you know, I, I am fighting for you, just so you know, but, you know, there are certain battles right now that, you know, we take the small win, just like no first person shooter. But the goal is to continue to educate those in decision making um, places at the district level to be able to get them to really understand what's going on. Um, and I think they're starting to see with what's happening with Palm Beach Lakes and getting to go to nationals and all that stuff. like. It is, uh, you know, principals understand it, but there are a lot of people at the district office that don't fully understand. It, so, well, I mean, I think it's a big step um, uh, that the district is allowing for them to do it on their own devices and not on the district device. That's huge, yeah. you know, because the yeah. bottom line is is that these kids are going to do whatever they want on their own devices, anyways. So, how are they going to, um, you know, police that? You know, so. Um, but like you said, it's like you're, it's about building community, but building the culture in your environment of your classroom so the kids know that none of those behaviors are appropriate for your classroom and for what the whole team, you know? And so, I mean, if, you know, as far as me, I consider myself, I don't consider myself a teacher, I consider myself a facilitator. I'm walking around that class and I'm looking at everybody doing everything. I can't stand phones. They drive me insane. That's something that I think that the district should say no phones at all during class unless the teacher tells you that you can bring it out. Okay, because they will sit there, some students and ignore you. And of course, I, I'm one of these type of people that I, I can't hold back, even if they're quiet. It doesn't matter to me because if I see that they're if they're passing the class and they're doing everything that they're supposed to do, and they still have time because they're beyond fine, but other than that, so the, that's a distraction to me, you know, the whole phone thing. That to me is more important in academia per se, you know, when we're teaching our normal core classes, whereas, you know, the extracurricular stuff is a whole different animal. But we're teaching them how not to do those types of things, and hopefully it'll go across to that other end where they won't do those things in class, you know, so I don't know. And that's the important point I want to emphasize that you just said. It's like that's you guys have locus you have locus of control over your official Discord channel. And you can't control all the Discord channels that are in the world in the internet, but you can't control uh, or have opportunity to influence behavior in your channel, which can lead to spread out elsewhere. Now, as far as you know, them going to other channels and then you know, and and that might potentially be may or may not be confusing to parents, like wait. Are you in the school Discord channel? Is that in your own um, permission letters to parents can be saying, we have an official Discord channel that's locked down for just our players and staff only, and we follow this code of conduct that we would like you to sign as well. Understand this is how we operate. And then include in there, um, if students use their account to join other Discord channels, this is the responsibility of the family to make those decisions for permission. So you, you, you just, by that being there, if a parent later on says, I don't understand why you're letting my kid be on, you know, X, Y, Z channels. Like, well, if you look at our permission stuff, we don't. We just use Discord as our tool um, and we use it for our space. It's just like Google Classroom, actually. You, you know, anyone can make a Google Classroom and invite someone with a Google account into that classroom, and that content could be way inappropriate. We don't ever think about that, but it's an open free platform like Discord that people can create their own thing. So you can make it, it's, it's, but you're not responsible for that. You're responsible for your school uh, um, platform um, space. Uh, and if you can just communicate that, if you decide to use Discord, just communicate that, and then that way, you, have, you shouldn't have to worry about parent response, especially 
if it's in the letter, they have to sign. And if they never read it, you say, well, I have your document with your signature right here. You did read this, right? Yeah, yeah, I read it. Okay, well, there's the language right there. You see that in bold? Yeah, okay, next. And I have to tell you from my own experience, not in esports, but some other things like that had this, these type of things were concerns. When I had those, those parent letters, and I'll get like one or two parents coming to complain. And then we'd sit down and talk and I bring out the document that they sign. I don't hear any more parents complaining because the parents talk to each other. They all, don't, don't, don't bring that up to John McCarthy because you know this is what happened and it's it, move on. So John, I have a, I have a question um, related to what, John Shoemaker, I have a question related <laughs> to what John McCarthy said. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering, I like what he just said as far as having that verbiage inside, um, you know, for the parents to sign and everything. But my question is, are we allowed to do that? <laughs> to do? To write that type of verbiage, because technically the, the district does not want us to use, you know what I mean? They're kind of doing it. Well, I mean, they still, no, I don't know how to they say still that. should be uh, following your your own code of conduct if you're creating your own discord for them. I mean, you know, it is still considered school work, even though it's their personal accounts on their personal devices. You know, it is something they're doing for a school after school activity. So, yeah, I mean, I think that it, all of those rules do apply, even though it's just a personal account. Okay, so it's okay for us to say that we are that we are going to have a um, a private Discord account. Yeah, if you, if you if that's how you want to communicate with your students for now, yeah, just you know, as long uh, as initially, we've uh, talked for about thirty minutes on it. So I mean, you know the risks. Uh, so that's what your choice is. That, that's totally fine. Other options are Google Classroom. That's also something that that teachers use. But you know that's. The Discord was, that's what IT security came up with for Discord, so. No problem. I just, I don't mean to keep continue on on the Discord thing. I just know that it's, um, I've seen my son use it productively, but I've also seen the bad side of it. So like I said, from the beginning, I'm on the fence on it. And I'm just starting out with this. I'm probably going to just use Google Classroom for the beginning. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Baby steps, but, you know, Discord is, is a lot bigger of a beast than probably Google Classroom since you've already used that forever. So, you know, maybe year one, you start with Google Classroom and then move up to something else. Discord's definitely a lot more of an advanced option. Hey, this has been a rich discussion. Um, and it was worth, I mean, this was important. This is what's worthwhile. And, uh, we are there any uh, what other questions or comments do people have? Are the kids allowed to scrimmage um, like actual people, like not school people? Is my question. Like if yeah. I was to have a league team and I let I had them all pick their pick it and then just queue up. Would they be allowed to do that if they have all chat off? Um, 100%, as long as each kid has their permission slip signed. Um, so the permission slip covers almost all of the issues you'll run into about creating accounts and what is and is not allowed. Um, I mirrored it very closely to our athletics packet. So that also includes a media release built into it. So like you'll be able to share photos and video of anything. You know, you need all of those things. If you're going to do Twitch, you need all of that permission slip. So it's literally all baked into the permission slip that the parent is signing that they're going to be accessing all of this different stuff. Um, so yeah, so if you're just doing regular, you know, waiting in the queue kind of thing, that's totally fine. Um, you know, ideally you find some friends at other schools that helps too um and you know kid, I, we've had a couple of interesting things as i've worked with nasef where like you know partner schools have gotten together and they've started to learn about you know the different parts of the country that the kids are from in addition to playing them so 
Um, you know, and then if you get into league play, like, so for example, when we were playing with EGF this past uh, semester, um, you know, the kids actually got to meet some of the real kids they were competing against in Orlando um, because, you know, they had all already played all these people, well, most of them, they played the regional people. They didn't know people from the Midwest and the West, but they knew some of the kids from the East Coast. Um, so then they finally got to meet those kids in person and compete against them. So yeah, definitely um, yeah, you can totally have them compete against, you know, whoever they want. Like I could do a clash team if we wanted to as practice. Yeah, if that's how you want to do it. Yep, exactly. And the kids could actually play ranked. I mean, but yeah, because that's, I mean, if you got the permissions, I mean, that makes sense. You have them play, in, I mean, they have to play ranked if you're playing 5v5, because um, you don't want to, normals is not going to be <laughs> um, what you want to do in that regard. I'm going to have to start playing these games with my son. <laughs> yes, yes. And he'll, he'll love that for you. He's like, wow, you're going to play this. Oh my God. He, um, when he was like, what was, I think he was in elementary school. He set up the whole um, uh, Discord server for one of his teachers. <laughs> he wanted them to use it. And they're like, okay, okay. And I'm like, all right, son, sure, they're going to use it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she didn't discourage him. She just let him set it up. She just never used it. He says, Mom, Miss So and So still has the Discord server. <laughs> she never did anything with it yeah yeah all right well we're we're at the top of the hour three o'clock so we're going to close we're going to reconvene tomorrow and can, we'll, we can continue this conversation and, and others you know take some time and just kind of reflect and digest the information i know we was a lot that we explored um, we're going to revisit the need to know list and, and tomorrow morning, and then we're going to dive into additional aspects of running a team. So thank you all for participating today, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.